Welcome to the Foul Play YouTube channel. Hello, everyone. Went to the open mic at Foul Play. We've got a pretty good uh, host of people that have come today to the open mic. Everybody's always welcome to come. Um, as everybody can see today, we've got uh, Alice and BB, Cole, Rhonda, Jinx, O Dog's back. Dr. Suckman and Sammy, and um, today we're going to uh, continue on with our discussion that got interrupted last week. I do apologize. I have internet issues with, it's actually a, a modem that's got the issue, so hopefully they'll get my other one sent. Right now we're doing well. Everything seems to be okay, so I do apologize to everyone out there that showed up and we were having a good conversation and everything just kind of crashed. So anyway, um, we're going to pick it back up. Uh, well, I'll refresh her first. Uh, we were talking about last week um, the report from Harrington, a DCI report, and what he said uh, in relation to uh, talking to Agent Fassbender, uh, report 167 caught my eye, and he said some things in that report that uh, – you know, we're left with a, a, an information gap uh, because, you know, he told, Harrington told Fassbender that they employed a locksmith to gain entry into the rap. So gaining entry can mean a whole bunch of different things, in my opinion. I don't know what it means to you all, but that doesn't mean he made a key. That means that they got into it. Um, so with that said... If, you know, there's another aspect that I want to talk about here in a few minutes, but with that said, um, I'm probably going to let Old Dog jump in here, and I'm going to go to whichever. I, I don't want to move, uh, get too far forward, but that pretty much is the basis of what we were talking about. And then this led into Old Dog had written a, uh, a reply, a comment to my Reddit post uh, pointing out several different other DCI reports that are really related to this. Now, this leads us off into some other directions, but at the same time, it, they're all interconnected to uh, one degree or another. So, oh, Doug, if you uh, want to jump in, I'll move to whichever uh, DCI report you want me to go to, and we can go from there. I can't remember which one we were on exactly. Yeah, I don't have them all memorized, but well, I've, got them all, I, I've got them all up. I've got uh, 167s <laughs> up now. Then. Yeah, your your report yeah. talked about. Them, I got them up. I got them up here. Just remembering what report is which. Um, okay, yeah. So last week we were, I was kind of brainstorming about the um, relevance of the reports being written on December. Was it fourteenth? And that is the time when Fossbender learned that um, the of the contents of a memory card that was found, um, and. There was a picture of Avery's boat trailer taken back the prior June. And there were some other vehicles on that memory card too. So when he got this report, he also filled in a report for November 6th, where he asked for um, Harrington, uh, basically if they found any cameras or phones. And um, then he specifically asked Harrington, did you find any flashcards? And that was kind of a point of interest uh, because it's kind of a strange thing to ask for. I mean, I understand if it's a big list of items to ask for. Um, sure, that could be included, but he he pointed that out. And at the time, um, it just seemed like it was in relation to the same time that he got the info of what was on the card. So maybe he was putting multiple things together. It was a little confusing as to why um, he might ask that question. Um but however, going back over the records over last week, it, I kind of changed my mind on the topic a little bit. Um, when I read the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office um, details of what transpired there, um, I found Remaker who stated that he, on November 5th, right after they found the vehicle, he went to the back of the vehicle and looked in and saw a memory card with Teresa's name on it. And he said he reported that to Weigert right then and there. So that to me is a good 
reason why Fassbender probably asked if there were any flashcards found. Um, he did have that report from Remaker at trial. Both um, Sergeant Orth and Remaker both said that they saw a memory card in the back. Sergeant Orth in his report called it a piece of paper because that's what he thought it was at first. Um, and that it had Teresa's name on it. Um, so I kind of zoomed in on that photo a little bit of, that we have of uh, the flash card. And there are only two photos that we got from the cargo area. One of them's a little easier to see. I think it's exhibit 300 and 301. Um, but it's kind of one of these things when you zoom in and stare at it, it kind of makes sense a little bit because I started to actually see um, Teresa's name written on the piece of paper. Um, at first, I thought it was just kind of a blurred out um, writing on the card or the brand name or whatever, but um, kind of when I, I noticed what, something that looked like a T, uh, it, the rest kind of made sense. And now, now I can see it. At trial, I think it was Michael who said that um, it was a verbatim flash card. I've seen some Reddit reports saying, oh, I don't think that it, it doesn't look like a verbatim card. Um, okay, yeah, so that is, um, you can't really zoom into that one. I think there's one other photo that's a little easier to see than this one. Um, I know, I'm pretty sure it's exhibit 301. I think I've got it. Let's see. That one, that's gotta be it. I'll just wait till it up, updates here. Well, anyhow, as I was saying, the um, he said it was a verbatim flash card. Um, it's true the colors on the front of the verbatim cards, I think back then were purple. I was going through the Wayback Machine and taking a look at what was sold at that time, and they Sounds looked purple on the front. That's, a, that's the one. So if you zoom way in, I don't know if this will be, I can see it's kind of sideways written in. Um, I don't know if you can highlight where the T is, like the capital T. I, I really can't. That's just, that's just a photo of your, I mean, I, I can't really do too much to it. Um, well, I don't know if you can hover over it where it is with the cursor, if that would probably, show. I'm going to guess it's going to be somewhere in this neighborhood here. So anyhow, I, I see the T there. It's sideways. So you, if you kind of tilt your head to the left a little bit, you can see it. it's on a white piece of paper that stuck to it. And um, yeah. So that is the name tag that uh, they were looking to at the window. Um, obviously, why did they notice that? Well, they were looking for any sign of Teresa. They said they checked under the car. They looked inside to see if it was her vehicle and uh, they found something with her name on it. So that's why it stuck out. That's my interpretation of why it stuck out. But um, anyhow, the verbatim uh, CF cards, uh, actually a CF card, if you look at, it has two sides. There's a sticker on the front and a sticker on the back. The one on the back is usually white where you can write a label on it, and the one in the front is the colored one. So I assume this is the back of it. I saw some other recent verbatim cards that have a similar backing, um, but not quite exact. I think the red marks there are the CF logo in a diamond shape, which stands for Compact Flash. Right. Um, and but so I'm I'm pretty sure that they want to get the verbatim aspect of it wrong. It just looks different because it's on its back there. Um, so yeah. I, it's one of these things we don't really know what was on it. Um, there were no, there was no metadata found on the photos that were in it. That could mean it was corrupt at some point. We knew they uncovered at least somewhere between three to five in the burn barrel. So she probably had a number of them on her. Maybe it was one that was given her problems and kind of discarded it and it got shuffled around. But um, going back to Harrington's report, which is interesting, is that Harrington talks about the blood in the rear area and making a big note of that. And it's strange that he wouldn't see this flash card just right there. And when you look at the trial um, transcripts, I think it was, yeah, Orth, who clearly said that he saw that memory card by looking in through the back tailgate window. So it wasn't the side, he was looking in, 
and it was right there. It didn't even use a flashlight. Um, so how they could open up this back tailgate and not see it there, uh, it's certainly puzzling. It is, and, and actually, um, I went a little step further. I, I did um, uh, read about Orth's, um, well, the other one you sent me about uh, uh, what Remaker, in Remaker's report in the MTSO summary report, uh, I also went and pulled up um, Orth's testimony, and it is interesting. Uh, I can't remember if Strang or Buting were, was questioning him, but regardless, it, the, the memory card was mentioned uh, multiple times, and um, the uh, various things about, you know, uh, people who are around it and around the RAV, that is, and well, what they did. And uh, he distinctly, Sergeant Orford, uh, distinctly remembered it. Um, and that that was interesting, everything um, about that. There are a couple of things that uh, come from the memory card being there and Harrington's report. But one other thing that's really interesting about um, the testimony, if you read through the rest of it, and I did, and it didn't really jump out at me back when we did the recordings, but it kind of does now. Uh, when Kratz get up, gets up to do his uh, cross or redirect, whatever, the really the only thing he asked him about was that memory stick at, or that memory card. He didn't ask him about anything else at all. He talked about the memory card. I've got that report if, if anybody wants to see it. I didn't. I forgot to pull it up here, but, uh, and the one from the summary report, I pulled both of them up and highlighted them, but I forgot to pull them back up. If anybody wants to see them, I think, um, Sergeant Orr's report is day four starts on about page 147. I think is where the memory card is first mentioned. So it, it's interesting. I, I really thought it was interesting though, that the only thing that Kratz asked him about was the card out of everything else that they talked about. So, there was some kind of a dealing. It just I don't know. It, it just seemed it just seemed a little odd to me. So anyway, um, next thing I guess um, is there anything else that uh, about the uh, the uh, DCI reports that you wanted to talk about? In, in the you know we've got several we pulled up um, in relation to this. You know and how they all kind of interconnected. I mean, we kind of talked about quite a bit of it last week. Um, yeah, I think it just seemed with the number of reports that were written on that day, December 14th, it kind of sounded like he took all his notes together and finally did his homework with it and made official reports out of everything. Yeah. Uh, but um, also interesting on the flash card is that, yeah, it was swabbed and tested for DNA. They did isolate the DNA from it, but it appears they never tested it. Uh, unclear on if there was anything visible on it. There is a report in case where they listed it as a stain, a swab of a stain on the compact flash card. Yes. Um, but yes. then Sherry Colhane reviewed it and said, uh, yeah, we have the DNA if the defense wants to test it, but she didn't see any visual stains on the flash card. Yeah, that's another good point that uh, you know you and I had uh, had been talking about uh, over the last uh, little while, um, and I had called that a that there was a blood stain on the back of of that um, memory card, and that's wrong. That's wrong with me to say that, and uh, for I don't like putting out misinformation, and I think that I think that my bad memory came from. Um, and talking about this a long time ago, and when I say long time ago, I mean like five years ago when we first got uh, Cole Haynes reports and, and some of these different things. Uh, the A13A or A13, the memory card, there was a lot of speculation and innuendo theory, whatever, that there was blood on that card. And in fact, it from everything that I can find and clearly that you can find, you've linked to it, to it as well because you questioned me about it um, correctly uh, about there being a, a blood stain on the back of it. And best I can tell is exactly what you said. They swabbed it. They isolated the DNA. And that was it. They didn't run it for a profile. 
So we have a uh, JD asked if um, there was any dates on this, and I was I was I wrong when I said the metadata was missing. Right. Uh, well, Fassbender was asking Schuster, why is there no metadata on this on these pictures? There's no date of when it was taken. There was no info as to what camera took the photos. Schuster gave a response saying that it could have been something that maybe she took it with a different camera and uh, then switched to her other camera. Um, that could cause some corruption in CF cards. It might have had something to do with the, I know those cameras had a date in time battery maybe the battery went bad but i i don't think that would account for the type of camera that took the photo uh, you I know think... i have a i have an old camera and it's a good camera and it takes that kind of card and it's from around that date around that era and um you have to actually when you turn the camera on you actually have to set that yourself on this one that i've got so some of them don't automatically do it yeah, I had I had an old Sony uh, digital camera from back around that time, and it did have a battery in it. And uh, now the battery did eventually, it's like a button battery, but uh, the battery, I had to replace it eventually. But uh, for um, a long time, I mean, once I entered the date, I didn't have to re-enter it. It saved. But yeah, I do remember other cameras like you were talking about. So that could uh, vary. Yeah, that could vary. And, and there is. Between cameras. From that time period, I know that lots of times when you uploaded or sometimes when you got pictures off of a CF card and up, you know, and put them into your computer, it would save under the computer, but would the computer would add its own dates to it. And that happened quite frequently. And maybe something happened where she where they put the photos back onto the card. Who knows? Um could there have is, been a corruption. There is, uh, Kathy Wilford who it insists that Teresa picked up her her camera at one point. So maybe she did have a different camera at, at one point. Well, I know that they were talking about that. Um, I seem to remember without going back and looking here that uh, uh, it was talked about that uh, Teresa carried a Canon power shot, a, a something power shot or something of that effect. I'd have to go back and reread it here, but and I, I don't really know what that means in terms of how good of a camera it was, but I can't, that was an assigned camera, right? From Auto Trader. Is that right? right? Power shot A310. Yeah, I saw that. Right. these little handheld point and shoot cameras. Not, not, it's not one of these DSLRs or anything. Right. No, it was a basically it was a pretty basic, inexpensive top camera. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, who knows with that kind of camera, even how it recorded metadata. We just, to, for, to answer Jay's question, uh, I don't know that we can, without doing some more research, I don't know that we can actually answer that. Because I haven't really looked into that aspect of it at all. So if anybody wants to jump in and do that, they certainly can. Well, thank you. Yep. No problem. Um, they yeah. still have that disc in, in custody, correct? They didn't go back to the yeah, they, they to showed it in, until like February of 2007 or something, right around trial, right? They brought it into trial and put an exhibit on it. I think it's 496. Yeah, they showed it to Riddles, asking if what it was, and they didn't take a. We don't have a picture of it. It seems apparently Special Agent Montgomery made a report of it. Um, none I of us. I saw a picture of it, in, in the pictures that have been released. I have yeah. looked everywhere. I cannot find a picture of it. You can't find a picture of the the flash no. card. No, Rebel. just the one. Just the one that uh, the one that I pulled up there a few minutes ago is the closest one that. I, the biggest, oh. the best close-up that I've seen. I, I was actually had uh, told Dog that um, a couple of weeks ago that I I could have swore I, I saw a photo of that SD card with her name on it. I mean, I, I thought I did too. Are you sure? Hey, well, you're I, in. Are you in the chat? If it's around, you I don't know where nice it's at. Fancy spreadsheet with everything on there. I don't know where it's at. If I, if there's a photo of it. Not in any of the usual suspects that I've looked at. I'm not, you know, I'm going to say that uh, if I've seen it, uh, I put it together mentally. <laughs> the, these diff these various people saying her name was on that card and then the testimony and all that. And I'm just visual and seeing the one in the back or the two in the back with something on it that looks like writing. I put it together mentally. So, 
that's a dangerous thing to do. I believe but... I believe her name's on one. Somewhere. Yeah, Jack, do you still have that comparison photo I sent you? I don't know if you could pull that up that shows why I typed in the name of where I see it. Um, I can just forward it over. One second. I don't know if I can pull that up or not, per se. I might be able to. If I remember right, there's also, they find a plastic case for one of those little discs in the front of her car, right? Yes, that's right. And we have a uh, picture of that case. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. I, I, I think I've, I can do it here, Doug. If it'll let me add it to this folder, we can look at it. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just put it in that one. There we go. Now let's see if I can pull it up. Let's see if this is, yeah, that's one I saved. Um, Yeah, it was one of these things when I first saw it, like zoomed into the card, I didn't think I could see much of anything and the name kind of slowly came into vision. <laughs> it's like one of those 3D pictures, you stare at it enough. Let's see if that pops in there now. Well, you know, the mind, like I said before, the, the mind can play some, some really funny things uh, on uh, Tricks on you. It does. It I mean it can with me anyway. Uh, let me get that off there. Oh sure, with so many details in this case. I mean, I completely forget about the whole thing with Kramaker and uh, Worth seeing it in the back of the car. That didn't work. It didn't do what I wanted it to do. Uh, Nope, that's not the photo I want. I don't know if it's going to let me do it because it, it was already preloaded. I don't know if it's going to let me do that. I went to the very end of my list here. It's not going to let me do it, unfortunately. And it's not going to let me do it, unfortunately. With this comparison uh, photo that uh, O-Dog had sent me, that was basically a side-by-side -side and where he had... Um, did, did you do it, O-Dog? Or you had... Yeah. So... Yeah, he'd, he'd, he'd put this side-by-side -side comparison of the, of the card with nothing on it and then with the card with some writing on it. So... Um, mm -hmm. Well, you can kind of see the faint writing of Teresa on it. I just kind of filled it in with actual text and to, to show you um, kind of how it's filled in. Right, right. So, I mean, from what you what you did there, I mean, that, that was kind of what I'm remembering seeing of, of the old photograph, but um, it's uh, I just had it in my in my mind of seeing an actual photograph of the card and it was a clear, you know, close up photo of an, you know, of that type of SD card. So, uh, I don't know, it's, it's really interesting that, uh, how that works out. Yeah. If you mind. find it, that'd be very interesting to see. Well, maybe yours or one of the others can, you know, remember that, uh, I, I, I just, I can't. I know many well, years I mean, ago they were trying to get a, a picture of it and, didn't see any result of it, but I checked the newscast too, in case maybe they had some footage of trial when they were bringing it into trial and you could see it, but no luck. Yeah. Did they put it in the CSO 2.0? Could it be in there? Like a picture of it? Um, I know they took a picture of the light and put it in that 2017 re reopening of the case or whatever they did in 2017. Uh, so, was, I'll have to look there too, I guess. Yeah, somebody would have to open it up and look. I, I, I like I said, I, I could have swore I remembered um, seeing that photo from 
way back, and I've looked everywhere. I've looked through every every known uh, photograph that I know to look at, and I can't find it. So if anybody is, uh, if anybody can find it, I'm I'm more than happy to take a look at it. So anyway, uh, okay. Any any other? Well, it wasn't there. <laughs> I, I I don't know where else to look for it. It's uh, not in the it's not in the ones that uh, Seeking Truth put on. I think they're actually the ones Henbury got. You know, like all of the case files. Yeah, I looked I looked through those. those. I looked through all of. I thought that's where it was. I thought I swear I saw it somewhere. I swear. Yeah, I I, I, I had the same dream you did then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. There is one aspect of the memory card, though, that, that does bother me, and I'm going to get to it here so we can um, move. Let's see, right. Uh, Jack, Jack. Yep. yep. If I could just say, it's definitely sure. not in, it's definitely not in CASO 2 report. I just opened it up and checked. There's a couple of pictures in there, but none of the memory card. All right. Yeah. I, I, one thing, one aspect, though, let's see if this, this should be popped in there momentarily. I'm going through the photos here. One thing it does it does interest me before I get back to um, uh, the opening of the opening of the RAV. That photo right there, you know, um, the parking lot, and we're going to talk about that some a little bit too, a little bit later. But uh, one aspect we have to think about: Harrington says they didn't notice it. Okay, now we have, of course, we have uh, Remicker's report. That, that was it, Jost, and then we have Orth that both said they saw it, or whoever it was, before it left Avery Salvage Yard. It's there. They said they see it. Okay, let's take that for face value. Erickson says that you know, he and Groffy, they were there getting the locksmiths got them inside the RAV, and they moved forward, taking the, and he, he's clearly, uh, they, they immediately took a, a presumptive test front and back ignition switch and some somewhere in the cargo area which means that they literally had to get the doors open so we'll move we'll get into that a little bit more in a minute but what's the one thing that's under the back seat there it's the parking lot so the killer you know i'm going to say the killer popped out the parking lot and however it happened we don't know but clearly something did they impacted he knocked out he and then he gets it pops it out and throws it up under the back seat but look how close that memory card is to that parking lot. It's right there. So was there some DNA or something from the killer? That sounds dramatic. That's on that memory card. I don't, I'm just asking the question because it, it just, uh, I've, uh, I don't know. I'm just making a, a leap here that it's just odd that that memory card um, is laying back there. Number one. Now with that said, I'm pretty sure that how it worked for Teresa and Auto Trader is after she did her thing, she mailed in her the the you know she mailed in the the memory card and and uh, which photo was which I don't know, I guess she numbered them or whatever I don't know exactly how that worked uh, to Auto Trader and you know she went and made her deposits in the bank and I guess paid them uh, their cut she kept the rest whatever she was due. I think that's how it worked. I'm not really sure, but regardless, she mailed the memory cards back. Now, I'm guessing from that aspect, maybe she has set, you know, she wrote her name on that card so they would know, Hey, this is from me. This is from Teresa Hobbock. So, uh, they would know, you know, they can, it wouldn't get jumbled up and screwed up somewhere and they would have to look. So maybe that's how her name got on it. Number one, but number two, it laying there to me, it's just, I don't know. It's just odd to me that you would leave that kind of a piece. I mean, it's not like a, you know, like a super expensive piece of thing. But back then, SD cards weren't necessarily that cheap either. They're relatively cheap now, but back then they were not. They weren't super expensive, but um, so it's just odd to me that they would leave it laying there. And and the the killer, you know, he he's right there beside this parking lot, uh, you know. So they're in that area. Thoughts, comments, move on, theories. Well, no, I was just, I was just going to say, I've got the, uh, I've got the photo on the, the TV, 
and I don't know if it's just my eyes or not, but on the light, you can see the sort of orangey tint on the white bit, you know, the, 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 the one that just all of a sudden disappears. Uh, you talking about the back of the RAV? Oh, aye, the back of the RAV, the photo that's, that's on the screen, the new, the, on the light. On the, the the white bit of the light, it looks like like an orangey sort of tinge. Uh, you, or if you're talking about maybe right in that area. No, it's, no. Maybe it's just my maybe it's just the way it's coming up on the TV. Um, but you know how we've been saying that we think that it's been um, the light was hit or maybe have been moved by that car. And there was dirt or something like that on the light itself. Um, but and then some of the other photos, it's no there. It's like it's been wiped away. Oh, are you talking about on the parking lot? Oh yeah, yeah. We're gonna get a little bit more into that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. right there. Yeah, right there. That's it's like an orangey sort of tint. Yeah. On the light, but then in later photos, it's no there. You can't even see it. Right. It's gone. You know, so is that them trying to get rid of the paint that was maybe used? Because I think that car was used to move that red car that was blocking the, the, the drive on the Avery Salvage Yard. And I oh, think and that's the, how it got broke. You're talking about the, going the back way into the Avery Salvage property. Yeah, they had that old, yeah. that old rust-colored Pinto or whatever it was. Uh, it, aye. Aye, exactly, Jax. Aye, and and that you see that you see the tinge in that, but later on in forties, it's not there. It's like it's been wiped away. Uh, right. Yeah, we're gonna. Yeah, I've got a few more photos, and we're gonna pull up and look at about the parking lot. But you know, this this is close association is what was interesting to me. I, I don't. I, it may mean nothing, but um, at the same time, whoever was the you know we're gonna. I'm going to say the killer was driving the Rav. Cause the problem um, with whatever happened to the parking lot, it gets shoved up under the seat, and all this shit's laying back here. You know. You know what's funny? You know what's funny though? They took individual close-up pictures with evidence tags of everything in her rav, including a freaking wrapper, candy wrappers, whatever wrappers, but yep. none of them so far are of that. Oh, the memory card? No. I can't believe it. The reason they don't have a picture of that card. The memory card is because that's Calumet County. Like when they get the evidence, they get the evidence back from the RAV and they don't even, they get it in like bags in the back of the RAV. They don't, yes. they're not actually collecting it from where it is in the car. So they, when they get that back in January of, of 2006, that memory card was still in the possession of the DCI or the lab or whoever had possession of it that that doesn't actually come back to the calumet county ledgers until may like i said february 2007 right oh yeah the memory card yeah that's right the memory card that's correct yeah it, they don't get the it back till way came later back, i think in, in may of 2006 the swab which would be what 2013 or a 13a or whatever it was that's right a 13a that that's right back earlier but the the actual card didn't come back until right before trial which is weird in itself. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I don't want to make too big a deal of that. I just caught my eye that parking lots under the seat, memory cards sitting right there. Killer had to be in this vicinity. And what else did they touch? Did they touch the memory card? Is it their DNA? I don't know. I'm just because there's also I think, that wrapper right there that they could have touched. That, that's right. Well, you know, well, I think that could we, be their wrapper that they were eating from their lips could have touched it and stuff. <laughs> we don't. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, we know that there was, uh, I mean, from everything we can find out from Colleen, you know, I, I think she lied about a lot, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, we, they, we've established that there, this wasn't stained, the, the memory card. However, they did isolate a DNA pro, uh, they uh, did isolate DNA and did run it for a profile, which again, I think that's very interesting that they didn't do it since, Given the proximity to all of this stuff in the RAV, the blood that's back in the cargo area, which Ken Kratz says, you know, everything, uh, Teresa was laying back there. I mean, why, you know, why wouldn't you want to run that for DNA? I mean, it, so anyway, um, before we 
if there's nothing more about that, I'm going to leave that as my little weird question and thought and move on. Uh, Jack, Jack, yep. Jack, yep. if I could yes. just make a comment. Sure. There's also, there's also in the back of the RAV, can you see that clear um, piece of plastic uh, to the right of the memory card? That's the yes. stylus. That's the stylus. The stylus of the um, Palm, Palm Pilot. Pilot. Yep. Palm Pilot, correct. And there's a, has anyone ever considered the fact that both the stylus and the memory card could have actually been in Teresa Horbach's pockets and they fell out when they threw her in? Uh, that's true. You know, there's one more thing, Doc, before, uh, that I will comment on. I don't know if any, everybody else knows this. The Palm Pilot took that same kind of memory card as her camera. Yes. Yes. I didn't know that so, for a long time. Yes. Um, so we actually don't know the origins of those two items, where they actually come from. And when you think about it, if you're a professional photographer, you're not going to just dump them in the back of your uh, RAV4, right? <laughs> you're gonna, no, no you're way. Gonna place them in a, you're going to place them in a secure location. And what is weird is that Colhane was asked uh, during the trial, okay, how do you do a testing? How do you do a presumptive testing? Or how do you test for DNA? And she said that we look for a stain. If we see a stain, uh, we do a presumptive test for blood. If the test comes up positive, then we do another swab and we do a DNA test. If that memory card didn't have uh, any blood on it, I don't believe it did, then it's interesting that she took a swab um, and isolated DNA, but didn't process it for a DNA profile. That's so the we weird don't part. Know that's correct. So she extracted DNA. So it's touch DNA, right? So That's I right. think the I think the main problem here, Jack, is the same problem we have with A twenty three. The state wasn't interested in any other genomic profile being in that RAV, right? Right. So they didn't they didn't do any further processing. And I think um, Mystic Jing said, "Look, and you also pointed out that if you've got." The back of the rap, you think about it, you've got the killer who placed um, the victim in the back of the rap. There is a very high chance of a mixing of blood or DNA, which meant that if you're doing a proper forensic investigation, like you highlighted, you would swab everything in that rap. Everything in the, especially in the back of the rap. Absolutely. See, okay, who's been, who's actually been in there? But there's one problem, right? If you start getting genomic profiles that aren't Brendan or aren't Stephen, um, that's going to make your story uh, much more complex. So you're saying is that it's basically like the cop or the lawyer or even the judge. If they don't, if they're afraid of the answer, they don't ask the question. They won't <laughs> ask the question. Correct. So therefore, you don't approach it. You don't um, discuss it. So that's why Ken Kratz and the other prosecutors, they talk to their um, witnesses, that the witnesses actually know what questions they're going to get and how they're going to answer it. If you don't want to approach any area that's potentially embarrassing for you or for your investigation, it's simple, Jack. You don't ask the questions. Right. Unfortunately, the, the defence... I didn't ask the questions either. And that is unfortunate because I, I don't know. I'm, it just it just made me wonder the, the parking lot being back there, number one, that's a, already a big problem. But, you know, I think we can all agree that the killer put it back there. I, well, somebody did. I mean, <laughs> the, other the other possibility was that if Teresa Horbach was involved in an accident, um, some type of incident where she was run off the road or whatever, and she actually picked up the, the light, it meant that she had to go to the back of her own car, open up the back door and place the light in there. And the killer took the opportunity to hit her on the head. And blab, so blabber. we know, we, yeah, we know that the attack occurred behind her own RAV4 due right. to the blood splatter. So we know that, and that's, 
the state got that wrong, right? The state's hypothesis was the killer or killers picked up Teresa Horbach and flung her into the back of the RAV, right? And the blood from her hair, they hit the back door. We know this. We now know that's not the case because of the angle of the blood droplets. That's a, a very important clue. Absolutely. I agree. I don't believe she was, sl- I don't believe that she, her hair slinging off made those stains on the, the back cargo door. I think that Zellner's yeah. expert has proven that false. Correct. I agree. So good. Yeah, interesting. I wanted to move on to entry into the RAV. And um, this is in conjunction with the conversation. It wasn't a long conversation, but Henry did point out a couple of things. And um, this is in relation to them moving the RAV. So let's consider, I mean, this key here, of course, it's dated the 11th. This is the key that apparently the, the lab had made. Now, the 11th, of course, now we're days later. So the key in itself is all fine and dandy, uh, but it's kind of irrelevant in a lot of ways. So let's move back to November fifth when the crime lab or the the cops were called time of god found has found this rav and they you know everybody comes running and um i, I think that you know i believe uh, uh what henberry has written out he, he detailed it pretty correctly in his um you know your rav series and um he, he did pose a couple of really good questions about entry into the rav and I think that, um, you know, if you, given what he's presented, uh, there's only a couple of things that, that could have happened. Now, I could be wrong. This is theory. This is speculation. And I'm going to try not to drive off the road too far. So if we say that beyond a shadow of a doubt that someone had to get into the RAV to put it in neutral, um, Using there, you know, there's a shift lock release. I know you know what I'm talking about, Doc. You remember we had those discussions before? Yes. The, sh- the shift lock to get the, the RAV into neutral so they could actually move it because, short of bas- basically half disassembling the front end of the car, those front wheels were not going to move. They just weren't going to move. <coughs> that's, just, that's just the way those things are made. So, Let's just say that they slim jimmed the RAV4 on the property and got in and, and shifted it into neutral. Uh, now, of course, we don't have a running video of the day, and that certainly is not the testimony that we got. Ken Kratz made that clear that the RAV4 was locked and nobody got into it. But we know Ken Kratz will lie when it suits his purposes. So, and the reason they didn't, you know, they had to say that they didn't want, they had to keep that thing secure is because of what was found inside of it. And everybody's going to say, oh, well, you guys got in there and did that. So the state side of it is, hey, we left this thing locked the entire time. But the other side of it is uh, Earl's testimony, without a shadow of doubt, there's some falsehoods all throughout of it. Um, It couldn't have happened the way he said it happened. It just couldn't. That RAV is not built that way. And... um, Whatever Earl said that they did to the front end of the RAV is not enough to have made those wheels turn. It just wouldn't work. So let's just say they slim jimped the driver's door, got into it, put it in shift lock. That still doesn't satisfy getting the doors opened, all of them. So my speculation, my speculation is when Groffy got there, he says the driver's door was open. That doesn't really satisfy getting the car to open because there's no release. I talked to him very about this specifically. There is no release inside that RAV that will open that back door, the cargo door. However, if they hooked up the battery to the RAV and hit the unlock button, that would have unlock, unlocked all five doors. Questions, comments, or you, does Jack ran crazy or... No, I'm, I agree with you. Um, and saying that, and although, I mean, looking at that picture, that key, if that is the key that they've just got cut to open that car, that key looks more used than the actual key that they used in evidence. 
Well, this was made on the 11th. And I'm pretty sure that's when the, I don't remember whose report it was, but there was another report that details um, it was days later. That wasn't actually made on the 11th. That is the day that Tyson or Hawkins got it back and gave it, that's the day that it gave, they gave it the Calumet County tag number. And that's what he's picturing. He's showing you that it's now got a Calumet County tag. And that's when they received it back from the lab. I'm pretty sure it was the 11th. So the lab could have made it the 5th, the 6th, the 7th, yeah, we, the 9th, or the yeah, 10th, we, or uh, early in the 11th before they returned it. You know, and, and that brings us back to the sale report 167. They made entry. Now, I uh, I think, you know, from what we have seen, they couldn't have made a key without getting in, opening a door panel and getting the locking code because the VIN number wouldn't have satisfied enough because that would, if they were going to use a, a, the VIN number to create a key, that would be a lot of different keys. Now, that may put them in the ballpark of saying it's a RAV, you know, locking uh assembly, but to get the specific key, as I remember, the facts that Vettering got back from Toyota and s said that they had to remove, they had to get to the uh, the uh, door lock to get the code. That's what, what I remember. So anyway, that's the only way that I know that they could have done it uh, before Groffy got there, uh, or even maybe while he was there and he just left it out. I don't know. I don't know that he was... And, you know, there are questions that didn't get asked about getting in, gaining entry to the RAV, uh, maybe because, you know, Beauty and Strain weren't familiar enough with that car to understand you can't just open the back door without it being unlocked. There's no inside latch. So that's my, that's my theory. Right. But the, uh, it actually takes time uh, to get a key cut, right? The, oh, yeah. the main issue is that the main issue is that you need to get a code. Now, whether that code, it's we looked it up in the manual. You have to go to the passenger side door and remove the uh, entire door panel to get to the lock. And on the actual lock, there's a code. Yes. But they also they also contacted um, Toyota, and Toyota could give them a code as well. I don't believe you can get a code from the VIN number because if you could. That they'll just do it themselves, right? What What's the point of having a lock? What's the point of having a code on a lock inside a door cavity if you can just simply get it from a VIN, right? right. That's Doesn't right. make any sense. No. So it, it, if one thinks about it, right, um, no one, uh, when they were examining the Toyota RAV4, says, oh, yeah, 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 we gain entry into the RAV4 by a key that the crime lab made. There was no mention of a key. The key just happens to come along a little bit later. But uh, as Mr. Jing said, we actually don't know what the chronology of making that key was. The key just suddenly appeared. But if you wanted to examine the inside of that um, Toyota RAV4 as quickly as possible, then you, you call a locksmith and they uh, use a Slim Jim. Open up a door. Once you open up a door, you can open up the other doors, but you have to go inside the Toyota RAV4, right? Now, if you're trying to preserve forensic evidence, that's a huge no-no, correct? Oh, Would you agree? Yeah. Oh, gigantic. <laughs> if they were going to do that, right. they should have opened it at the Avery property, right? That's exact. That's correct. And as someone said, if the back door doesn't have an internal latch, um, then... Um, either you have to connect the battery or there was another way to open up the rear cargo door because you can see they've actually taken photographs of the rear cargo door open. So did someone actually crawl inside the RAV4 and open up the back door? If they did, then potentially they're contaminating the crime scene, right? So oh, Absolutely. The, so the bizarre thing is there's no evidence that a key was cut. It, it tends to suggest that the locksmith uh, uh, used a Slim Jim, and I believe there's a photograph that actually shows an indentation of the rubber 
yes. of the of the window, and that's exactly what will happen if you put in a prod to uh, put in a slim jim. And we've seen the picture; they put in a little hook and they hook the door latch open, and up opens the door. I, I did look around. I didn't look hard for that t- particular picture. I, d- we I saw have it in seen- the manual. Yeah, yeah I- someone actually. Uh, the um, the uh, people who repair doors and door locks, they actually published a manual to show how to do it <laughs> using a slim gym. Wow. Yeah, I, I looked around. I, I couldn't find it because I wanted to include it to, so that we could kind of look at the indentation. But uh, there's what? Yeah, I was going to say, sorry, Jack. Um, okay. There's one question I want to say. You know, the back seats, how they're folded down, were they always folded down or did someone fold them down in the crime lab i think they were folded down in the crime lab interesting i I don't know that but because i mean we could do a comparison and i didn't i don't think i have those uh readily available but i think if you look down in the crime lab then that would mean that the crime lab stuck the light under the seat because the light is literally like propping up the folded down seat you can't would would you be able to put that underneath the seat with it out being folded down like that i i, I don't know i don't know you can i think it's pretty flat on the floor what otherwise the seat is uh, and the other the other thing is did anyone who saw the um memory stick did anyone mention seeing a rav4 light in the back uh, I don't remember anyone seeing, uh, saying that. Do you know, Doug? No, it was, I think North said the only thing he saw was a piece of paper with their name and turned out that piece of paper was the memory card. Yeah, interesting. No one may, no one mentioned something that's a hundred times bigger sitting in. Normally you don't find the blinker light in the back, uh, in the back right? So no. Something has happened. I think if you look closely at some of the photos of the RAV4 at the Avery salvage yard, um, I think the blinker light is out, it's missing. So therefore that blinker light had to have been in the RAV4, right? Because it doesn't appear that that blinker light was there. So it was already in the RAV4. Um, And it's interesting that no one makes a comment. Oh, by the way, we saw this big blinker light in the back. I don't recall it. Yeah, well, that's correct. Um, some of the photos that Pam, well, actually one of the photos that the Sturms took, um, you can see the the inner fender paneling is gone yeah, and there are I, holes where the light is. And this, this is a good topic that Jory's brought up with that inner paneling because the inner fender is all rolled up under that tire, like something impacted it. And it, I think Jory's mentioned the tires could go in reverse and they could draw that up. That's why it's up so high. But yeah, when you look at that uh, driver's side photo that Pam Sturm took, or or her daughter, daughter, I don't remember who took it, but you can see the holes where the light would be. Yeah, yeah, I think that this photo here that's up right now, that's up in that area, and then back behind the the wheel up there, the inner fender. Yeah, it's it's all it's all jacked up. Something impacted it. That dirt that's in there because obviously the dirt got in there after the light was removed, and that could tell you if she went through the quarry if they could test that quarry dirt for the same minerals or whatever that they do. I mean, well, I've seen, it, yeah, I've seen them do the forensic files on dirt before. <laughs> like well, um, well, Crockett, I'm, I'm the- Crockett is saying all four wheels have rotated. Explain that. You know. Well, that 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 comes into you know uh, Henberry's uh, know your raft series. He 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 actually it's it's a very well and it's long. I, I won't lie to anyone. It's a it's long and it's detailed uh, about the movement of the wheels. And um, you know, uh, I have no reason to. I mean, obviously there's questions with everything, but you know, I have no reason to doubt his research. He spent a long time uh, writing that. Uh, the three-part series that um, really details how the RAV was moved and, you know, basically, and really how Ertl, he, well, let's just say it, he didn't tell the truth about how things really happened um, in the yeah, loading the, and, and the unloading. 
But the question is, Jack, does anyone actually believe that someone was able to crawl underneath the RAV4 and undo the drive shaft while the car was at the Avery salvage yard? Well, the I back mean, one, been... the, the back one, they they probably could have gotten to at some point. You know, they could have probably gotten to the back of the RAV. I, I guess, Doc, I don't know. But the, these front drive shafts are the real issue because mm. that takes a... To get to those, uh, you really got to do a major disassembly to the front. To get all, those on. all this makes me think of, you know, Occam's razor and it being the more simple answer is the truth. I, I mean, short of them uh, getting a crane and putting belly straps on, on the RAV to get those wheels not to move, they would have literally had to belly strap it and, and yanked it straight up, and they didn't do that. We know they didn't do it. And then, right. you know, backing, uh, they said that they pushed the RAV up into that container. Well, there again, that says that those wheels had to be moving, uh, which means to me they had to have slim jimmed the driver's door, got into it, and used the shift lock. I mean, short of them having a key um, and got inside to use the shift lock re release and, and move the RAV into neutral, or yeah. they could uh, so, roll it. So, so the question is, when did when did the locksmith actually perform his craft? <laughs> at the Avery Salvage Yard or at the crime lab? Well, I mean, it's, you see, to me, it almost it's almost like they're they're trying to cover themselves by saying they employed a locksmith later on. Yes. For the door of the car, the RAV being opened at all. Yes. They had to they had to explain that without a key. I mean, to me, they did. Yes, because in the, in the trial testimonies, um, they actually said that the guy who was trying to move the car tried to open the doors to see if he could unlock it, i.e. to get to the gear shift, right, and maybe also the handbrake. So one wonders whether they actually did open the door, you know, and but to keep everything kosher, they sort of like uh, didn't want to... Uh, didn't want to approach it by saying, oh, yeah, we actually did open the door at the salvage yard because really that's breaking their protocol. Sure. If they're not going to bring in the full forensic everything, you know, and Graham, as you said. Graham, Graham is saying, just look at the wheels. You can tell the RAV4 came from the quarry. But I have a question, you know, about the weather during that day and the yeah. days before that. Um, that could have. Uh, I looked at the weather at one point and I had compiled together a whole a whole thing of that whole day of when they found this RAV to try and figure out how much really did they need that tarp and was it really a bad storm and how much of a storm and it looked like it was misty out but the days previous I did, I did not look and I was just curious if anyone could even remember. As I recall, yeah, as I recall, it rained a lot that week. I don't remember it raining all that much. Well, uh, I know it rained a lot that after that afternoon or that day that they were there. Prior, I don't think there was a lot of rain before that. I don't know. I thought I did a weather check on on the week I don't know. of we can the thirty fourth to the fifth. Maybe somebody can remember it's in the in the chat. Uh, in, on well, the we YouTube. can we can actually we can, Jack we can actually see from the photographs uh, when they take the tarp off the Rav Four, it's it's really raining down. The car and, and on the sixth when they're when they're collecting the barrels too, I believe it was raining that day too. The yeah, sixth. yeah. There's a, there was a lot of rain and there was also a lot of water on the Rav Four. And in Ken Kratz's book, he said that <laughs> as soon as Fassbender got the uh, tarps removed, it poured. And apparently there was a big thunderstorm that evening. So, yes. yeah, there would have been a lot of water. It seemed like I, Did they uh, not I, see the tracks? Did they not see the tracks where the RAV came in? That's from Shane Henry. Well, well. that's that's really interesting because um, there's actually very little commentary about the tracks but also no one noted any footprints right <laughs> so somebody had to walk in and walk out but there wasn't any mention about footprints no 
I mean, they did. What about tire tracks? Uh, no one mentioned tire tracks either. No, they didn't. And you know, you know what makes you know, you know what makes why? Me... because aliens beamed it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, well. Here's the other alternative. How do you know that an end loader didn't put it in? You don't. That's true. You don't. It's like end loader because could affect it right up. End loader also have tire tracks that you could see that they it were like it that does. vertical it, to the car yes, or horizontal yes, to the if car. You, <laughs> yes, if you actually see the, there are um, tire marks or lanes next to the Rav Four. If you have a look to some of the pictures that were taken by um, the law enforcement officials, you can actually see two lanes of tire marks so quite quite clearly um a end loader was used to move vehicles because if you have a look at the tightness of the rav4 um jeepers how did they get it in there yours said there's no rain on the third or fourth oh well, there you go on the, the there's no rain on the third or fourth Right. Well, what okay. about the, the second or the first or even the day of Halloween? Because it, it, it's possible that up in Wisconsin that the, the, the soil would still be damp enough to leave. Yes. If you, if, you have a, yeah, if you have a look at some of the quarry photos, uh, there are pools of water everywhere. So there are, there are pools of water uh, all around the place. I, I, well, you know, it's fall, and uh, I mean, fall here in, in Michigan, I'm sure, is comparable to fall in Wisconsin. We get a lot of rain in the fall. It's just the way it is. Um, it, I mean, it doesn't rain all the time, but it, you know, you can pretty much count on from about October, November on. It's going to be cloudy. It's going to be raining or snowing. That's. It always is cold and raining on on uh, Halloween too here in in Illinois. Oh yeah, absolutely. So like back. Uh, like cold and rainy on Halloween too out there I wonder Jack Bram Moss was wondering if you could zoom in on that tire again yes I will that's about as tight as I can go it'll take a second there for, for it to catch up it'll be there in a second Is there, uh, did Graham have a question or he hadn't said yet? I don't know if he had a question, but he did. He just asked in the chat if he could zoom in on it. Yeah. Uh, uh I can't remember. Thank you. I missed it. Um, well, you know, that, uh, that photo there, it, you know, it kind of details, uh, th that open, open slot uh, i took uh, actually uh included a couple more photos because we had a conversation um yesterday or day before uh in the chat when we were just uh, chatting on on the discord about what lack of photos that there are in situ of that front left area and this is one of two that i can remember i think i have one more um I'm not sure if, if Graham has got a question before I move on or not. If so, and we can always come back to it. Um, but that Yours photo there. said no rain on the first or second either. That's interesting. Graham uh, says, can you see the grit in sand? Well, I kind of do. I mean. Well, that's my whole yeah. that's my whole point. Why don't they test it? Because I'm sure that the, the dirt at the quarry where they're, you know, digging for rock to make whatever, then you have the mud and stuff at the Avery yard on their property. You'd think there'd be a little bit of a difference that they'd be able to like test that dirt or mud or quarry sand or whatever it is, and you know. There's way to test that stuff with minerals, just like they would a DNA. Crockett, uh -huh. says, Crockett says, look closely at the gunnel rail below the front door. Mud scuffed off as if someone leaned on it. Um, 
Can, I'm not sure. can I just make Yep. Can I just make a comment, Jack? It's interesting that um Fassbender and Uyghur, uh told Stephen where they believe that the RAV4 came from, but also there's a DCI that is from the quarry, but also there's a DCI report that I was reading in which Skorlinski, now wait for it, told Chuck Avery where the Toyota RAV4 came from, that is the quarry. So all of them were putting it out there very early on that the Toyota RAV4 was actually driven from the quarry area. That's so right. So it's interesting. And remember, says, Ken, yes. Ken Peterson in the both newspaper reports for Green Bay and and Manitowoc Herald Times, they both had the same reporters, same story, but the and he tells the paper that they found the RAV4 at the Manitowoc Quarry Gravel Pit. Yes. That's where he tells them that they found it. That's so right. did he find it there? Because that's not where Pam found it. No. Nope. And uh No, I remember that. And and then he they changed the title in the Manitowoc Herald Times to say found on Avery Salvage Yard, but the content says the gravel pit. The one in Green Bay that's the same story, it says nearby. So where did they Oops. originally find the RAV and who originally found it? <laughs> Well, I mean, that's a, that's a very good point. But the fact that they did a flyover uh, and they couldn't find it on the 4th, I think it's, well, sorry, they didn't see it at the salvage yard on the 4th is indicative that indeed it wasn't there, right? right? And if we're thinking about planting, uh, then everything got transported back to the salvage yard, right? So right. if we're talking about the RAV, cremains, electronics, everything would have been brought back. So it, it makes the case against Stephen a much more airtight, whereas if cremains, RAV4 were found off the salvage yard, it's really going to be much harder for it to stick, for the story to stick. But it's interesting that as Crockett has examined and shown, that um, yeah, there's definitely it. It looks like it's been driven through mud, dirt, through a quarry, essentially. Oh, I, I absolutely think it came from from that area. Um, I mean, right. Just, which? It's... Go ahead. I was going to say, Jack, which then complements the dog tracks. Oh, right? absolutely. I was it's going to then, say that because but, the, the, what you, did you say yeah. about the dogs? They spent far yes. more time off of the property than they did. <laughs> correct, correct. Now, now I'm not an expert on the dogs, so you really need someone who has expert training with those dogs to interpret those tracks. But what is really interesting is that uh, there's a dog path or dog paths in which Kathleen Zellner is saying, hey, I can actually tell you how the RAV4 came onto the property. with You know those conveyor belts? that conveyor belt yes. that actually ran through the salvage yard. Well, apparently, according to Skalinski, the uh, path has been opened up to allow a vehicle to come in. That's in the DCI report, which I read. And Skolinski put it, put that to um, Chuck, right? So that's a very interesting point because what uh, the Averys did was they used to, they put that Pinto and other cars to block off, right? Because obviously people were taking shortcuts or potentially stealing uh, their cars from the property, right? They're just towing them off. So they actually blocked it off. The yeah, they were coming, that, getting cars yes, and, and stealing parts. Yes, yes. And in actual fact, the Avery said, yeah, we've had incidences where people have come in and stolen Bits and bits. Well, they'll come in from the quarry, from the back, right? That's so right. It's interesting that it all now makes perfect sense. The dog tracks, the mud on the RAV, the fact that they didn't see it on the 4th is really powerful. And the fact that Skalinski, uh, Uyghur and Fassbender are all telling 
the ivories. Hi, we know. That's amazing. One interesting thing, I was listening to the Chuck Avery interview with O'Neill and Skrolinski, and I don't remember which one of the investigators, but they, they tell Chuck that the RAV was in perfect condition. It hadn't had any accidents. <laughs> and I don't know if they were trying to set a trap for him, but I don't know. That just was very uh, interesting. Yeah, but also, don't you find it interesting that no one actually asked Brendan Dassey or Stephen that's, that's what, right. what happened to the light? Like, as you as you were saying, uh, Ojok, they could have set a trap, right? And no one asked the question. No one asked the obvious question. Yeah, and I think the order of questioning, though, is um, like you wouldn't crush the car if it didn't have any damage. And then Chuck said, well, what, what, like, what condition was it? And then they responded, oh, it was absolutely perfect. You know, there was no, there was no sign of an accident. And so I, I don't know if it was a trap or if it, who knows? It may have been a trap. Well, well, everyone, everyone who saw the um, RAV4 at the salvage yard when Teresa arrived, no one made the that they saw. Uh, the impression was, I think Schmidt, at Stephen Schmidt said, "Yeah, the car looked didn't look like new." Stephen made that point as well. So, if that's true, it gives a chronology. First of all, whatever Rodriguez said is absolute garbage and secondly it tends to indicate that an accident or damage occurred to the rab after she left the salvage yard not before that's right. important too it is important because uh and we yeah right they can they, they could have set a trap for Avery, but they didn't ask the question no because no, if he would have no, said, hey, didn't. and he, I don't know that he would have noticed, but, you know, he was around cars. He, he might have noticed that, you know, that parking lot was popped out. So. You know, you notice, like, blinker light isn't in the front seat or the back seat. It's actually in the back cargo. Yeah, now, showed if up. you were in a hurry, you just would have picked, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> you would have just picked it up and put it in the seat. In the back seat or the passenger seat, oh, well, I've got to go now. We'll fill, fill out an accident report, whatever. Oh, no, no, no. It was actually placed in the back of the RAV. So where did Teresa Horbach get attacked? At the back of her own RAV. So it's very, very interesting. I think you can you can build up a story there. We can. I, you know, just knowing, just trying to, you know, find out where, you know, whatever happened to get her to pull over an accident, somebody ran at her, whatever, caused her to stop. Something did, clearly. So, Also, that crumpled up inner fender of the driver's side wheel sitting up there, that looks like it's rubbing up against the tire. So if it was, it would definitely be making a racket driving around anywhere. But I don't know, unless somebody pushed it high enough that it wasn't touching the tire, but it looks awfully close. Well, you know, that was another thing that I questioned a long time ago was the, you know, uh, I, I talked a lot about the spare tire cover and what Uyghur did with it uh, or what we don't know what he did with it. But clearly they removed it once it was at the crime lab. They uh, tested it for uh, uh, latent prints, which apparently they pulled some. And then, you know, all this stuff goes back to uh, Queso on in May, uh, May 25th, I think it was, of 2006. Uh, Uyghur takes possession of that spare tire cover. He doesn't, there's no report saying that he did, but he did take it because at the end of June of 2006, he brings it to Hawkins and Hawkins fills out a report that he's turned this, that Uyghur has turned in the spare tire cover. You know, he, so he's had it over a month. He had it for 35 days. What was he doing with it? Why did he have it? He, he wouldn't just take it for no reason. I mean, to me, he wouldn't. He's got clearly. He yeah, should have a pretty full plate. Yes, uh, un unfortunately, the uh, prints were non-informative. Right. They were smeared, yeah. so they couldn't actually get any information. 
But I wonder uh, whether they did a swabbing for DNA. Well, that's my question because it's the, in that area, right? Correct. Correct. So, was there biologicals on the back, on that uh, cover that they swabbed and got? Uh, we that we may not and we clearly don't know about. Well, on the back on the, on the back the actual back door, there were uh, several prints, and normally if you leave fingerprints. Uh, you normally leave enough cells to do a DNA extraction. So even though those prints couldn't be matched to anyone, Jeepers, the, the obvious thing would be to uh, do a DNA test. That's right. You like, know, because it's it's contact DNA. That's right. And, of course, you know, we know A23 was back there. So, I mean, it wasn't on the spare oh, yeah. cover, but it was on the back of the door. Yes. So I Correct. think they should, I think, you know, the smart thing to have done after they did whatever with the latent would have been to have swabbed it to see if there was any biological on it. But obviously we don't know, but I still question why he would take it for you know over a month and just basically turn it in. And as far as I know, I've not seen anything to say why to detail why he had it. It's really weird to me. It's odd. So. There's one good thing. There's one good thing though, Jack, you can't plant the fingerprints. <laughs> right. Thank God for that. Or oh, Stephen Avery's fingerprints would have been all over that place. Yeah, I read a I read a thing. I don't remember who wrote it long ago about uh, the difficult. How I mean, it, it can be done, but it, it's really um, really difficult to, to transfer a fingerprint. It, yeah, it is. And if you're an ex, you can actually tell because uh, it the fingerprint impression is reversed because you've got to get the original fingerprint, yep. put it on a piece of tape. And then add it to a secondary location, and yep. if you're an expert, you can actually tell <laughs> whether a print has been planted. But yes, they didn't find Stevens or Brendan's finger or palm prints on that vehicle. True, sure, that's correct. So, okay. Uh, any I mean, questions? just just going back to the um, the light for a wee second. I mean, uh, Paul Ward made a good point. If that RAV had been damaged while she was going to Stephen's property, Stephen would have noticed the damage on that. And knowing Stephen or not, he maybe would have offered to help, to help fix it. You know what I mean? And that would have came up in any of the interviews or anything like that. And nothing was mentioned about it until Ryan Hilligus mentioned it in bloody court. Right, that she had had an accident and turned in turned it into her insurance and just kept the money. Yeah, well, that was really dumb of him to do that. Um, yeah, and I mean, it was supposed to be her first car, and she 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 apparently looked after it really really well. But God, if she claimed the insurance for a windy wiper, then I thought, I'm sure I thought it was claimed... her second car, her first car was like a crappy beater. Yeah, she had some, she she had That's a beater great. car. I mean, that was her first nice car. Her car, yeah, yeah, the first good car per se, but yeah, so I get she's what you're the, yeah, if she's claimed the insurance for a windy wiper, then she's not going to drive about with a broken light. No, agree, and, and other damage, inner wheel, yeah. inner wheel was uh damaged, which would have damaged the tire in the long run and all, so it would have cost her even more money to get it fixed. So if that had happened. With Teresa being in the in the motor, she would have got that fixed. She would have got it all fixed because one thing would have led to another and would have cost her more money. So if she's claiming for a windy wiper, then she's going to claim for a broken light. Correct. I would think Correct. so. And 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 being a professional photographer who photographs vehicles for a magazine, <laughs> you're not going to give a good impression going to clients with a damaged car like that. I'll Not post only it that, up. You, yeah, if you're driving on the road and the police uh, see you with a damaged light like that, you're going to get a ticket. Yep. Exactly. It's an, it's an indicator. It's an indicator. Yep. And, and yep. we and can't that forget. Take, that we, takes me back to the wee rusty bit on the light as well. It's there in, in the first couple of photos that you showed, but then later on in the photos, it's disappeared. Well, you know, we also can't forget the description that was put out. There was nothing about damage to that RAV. 
And also, right. even if that inter plastic inner fender thing was still crumpled up under the top of the tire, I doubt she would have kept it there. I mean, that's easy to just screw off and take off without it you know, potentially getting loose and scraping against the tire. That's right. Grandma yeah, and, says they more than likely know the killer is, but needed to frame Stephen. That, that's, that's a possibility. Yeah. And uh, and whoever made the comment about the missing the missing girl poster, that's exactly what they would have put in. That the damage that there was damage. So in other words, you can see many Toyota Rav fours on the road, but that blinker light is diagnostic of her vehicle, right? So if you're looking, you, you would look for the damage. It's like saying, oh, uh, look, we're, we're looking for this missing person and they've got a large tattoo on their forearm. So those are the details that you put down, right? But none of that was mentioned in any missing poster. Well, it'd be like, I mean, the damage would uh, identifying that RAV would be like putting a big orange flag on the back of it. It would have pulled it out immediately. Not just a you know this blue green rab blue green blue rab whatever. It's got a busted. Yeah, it's got a busted you know lip. you know according to what we have found um, about how you know how she was about her car and claiming a windshield wiper that she wouldn't like Crystal Terry just said she wouldn't have driven down there with that front part damaged either. I think Even that, Grandma says there's no way she would have drove the car with the indicator missing. The back one would not work, so she would have been pulled out over by police. Yeah, that's right. Doc pointed that out. I, I have no doubt that the, the damage happened just prior to. Paul Ward said it looks like a force stop damage. Quite possibly. That's possible too. Well, well, isn't that isn't that the perfect ruse? that could be used by the killer to stop Teresa Horbach. Exactly. Run her sure. off the road, cause damage. And look, if we've if you've ever been involved in a minor accident, the first thing you do is you stop your car and you look at your vehicle for damage. You look at your vehicle and you look at the other car that got hit, correct? You give a yep. look, yeah. right? Yeah. Which means you have to stop and get out of the vehicle. So in order to attack Teresa Horbach at the back of her own vehicle with the back door open, you had to stop the vehicle, get her out of the vehicle, and the killer or whoever attacked her had to follow her at the back of her own car. You know, another Do thing interesting. With that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, another thing uh, with this, Doc, I just thought about this. Teresa's a photographer. If her Correct. vehicle had been damaged and another vehicle had been damaged, what would be one of the first things she would have done? She would have photographed. Take a Pictures. photograph. Absolutely, Correct. she would have. And that might explain why you don't find her camera. That's right. Yep. <laughs> because if she took a vehicle, if she took a photograph of the other vehicle, hello. Hello, is indeed. So, well, you know, um, but before we move on, is there any more questions about that? So this kind of led me talking about the key and the rav. It just kind of led me. I was looking through some photographs um, over the last few days, and the one that's on the screen now, obviously, we know that's Bob, and you know what it looked exactly like. I'm not saying it's it. I'm just saying the color. I I don't know about the length. I've not, not tried to do a comparison. I'm sure other people. Have probably seen this and, and probably tried to do a comparison to this Bob, to the one that's photographed with uh, uh, the her the, this ballet key they allegedly found in Stephen's bedroom. But you know, I, it caught my eye just going through. It doesn't necessarily mean that we necessarily have to talk about it. I, it's just curious though that they and you know, they collected this uh, set of keys uh, that looks like a door key. I don't know about the other one, but this two thousand three. Uh, keychain that Avery had in his house. They, that's where they got this from. But that Bob caught my eye. I thought it was interesting, considering that they found this, allegedly found this, uh, the, Kucharski and uh, Lincoln Coburn found what they found behind that old record cabinet. It looks 
very similar to me. Don't know. Right, but but can I just it does, it does, but can I just ask a question, right? Sure. Now Teresa Hobart's car had a normal ignition, right? Which means that you had to put in the key to turn the ignition and the key had to stay in the ignition as you're driving. Yes. Right? So <laughs> What, what I can understand is where uh, where are her other keys for her house and her business and her premises? Where have they gone? That's right. Because or we've all had we've all had cars where you've got an ignition, right? And normally you have a bunch of keys that you you put in the car, and there's a bunch of keys with with your ignition key, and then when you turn off the ignition, you've got the handful of keys that you can either put back on the um a lanyard or just carry the fob in your hands so it as you can see there that's a really good picture because it doesn't contain one key it contains multiple keys which is what i would have expected to what teresa would have had well, but in port, all we in get port, is the valet key in 40 plus years of driving uh, Doc, I, I always had minimum of probably three keys on my keychain for my car. At least, at least, correct. At least, correct. House key, front door, possibly even back door, maybe even a garage key. So maybe you know it just would vary, but I never had a singular key of anything that I carried. Correct, correct. It, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't to me, you know, and this photo is, it, you know, it's interesting. There's, I mean, there's three rings here. That one's been added um, and it's around the blue fob. I don't know. It, it, it may not mean anything. It just, I don't know, it caught my eye. Um, I thought I, I just thought yes. I would include it. Um, okay. Moving on to, um, uh, I talked about earlier before we got on here. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of people believe, and I say a lot, there, there are many out there. I, I'm not one of them, but uh, that doesn't mean that the topic's not valid. Uh, moving on to the two rap theory, uh, and, and, and it is curious. Uh, and I, I actually included several photos in this. As we can see, uh, and this is just the first one I'll pull up. It'll come, it'll pop in there. Uh, it's already there. Okay, you know, these bins in the back. Uh, have no cover. This is the one on the right. And of course, this one's the one on the left. Uh, and that's got some, a little bit of tooling in it of, of various kind, whatever the toolkit that came with the vehicle, but the covers are gone. And, you know, there are, uh, you know, there, there are probably various explanations for that. Um, some people believe that, uh, you know, that uh, some inside parts were swapped. Um, within a singular RAV to, from one to another and that the actual RAV4 itself is gone. Uh, I can't disprove I that. It was a used car and it didn't come with those pieces. It probably didn't come with the mat that everybody talks about is missing. Also, the front center council part is missing too. That, yes. The hood it, that. It, it is. I mean, that's not a very good picture there, but you're correct. But I want to mention, because you got this picture open, see how the seats, when they're down, even when they're folded, they are so close to the to the bottom of the car, the floor of the car, that I don't think they would have been able to put that light in there if it wasn't folded down like that. Like, that's part of it. It goes up. Like, they don't go all the way forward, but they do go up some. That right, way. right. There's a lifting. There's a lifting motion when you uh, when the seat backs are up and it brings them off the ground. I don't know that we have a really good flat photo to show the distance between the carpet and the bottom of the. Uh, there's a walk uh, around video that I watched of a Rav for sale, and they yep. show how low to the ground that the the Rav is that makes it good for sports uti utilities, like putting your sports stuff back there. It's lower to the ground. Right. And they, there is no real big gap there between the yeah between the and the floor. I mean, I, I guess short of uh, unbolting the back seat, I mean, it looks to me like it does. Once you put the seats down, they do drop down. Uh, I guess maybe that's a design thing for if you want to load things, it gives you more headroom. I don't know. Possible. I don't. I don't know. We'd have to check that out. But you know, these bins that are missing. Um, or bin covers, I should say, 
Um, one thing I did notice, and we'll get to another photo here in a minute, looking at this carrying case has got, uh, it, it looks like it's got some dust on it, um, but not a lot because it's shiny. Uh, so if this one had been, to me, if it had been uncovered for any real length of time, that whole, all, all this would have been covered in dust. I don't know that that's true. I'm not any kind of forensic person that could say for sure, but I, I did notice that. Um, this one over here, I mean, this one on this side, it looks like it's got a huge amount of dust on it at the, at the bottom. So I don't know if this is one, I don't know. It just raises some questions that I can't, I can't fully answer whether that, you know, did she actually, did this brav actually have bin covers or, and she took them off or it didn't have them. Uh, I, I don't know. But this one's got a lot of dust uh, along this bottom that lip area right past where the bin cover would go in. Um, you know, I guess there are other aspects that, uh, you know, folks can you know, have questioned about uh, there being, a, I mean, obviously the color, you know. Uh, I, I feel comfortable in, in the color, though, uh, with lighting and with a flash. It, it alters how color is presented on a camera lens and uh, through the focal uh, and how it is in, has interpreted. And um, I didn't, I don't think I included, uh, it may be in this bunch here, I don't know, but you know, there's other, another, there are other photos of the RAV about the color that show it in a shaded spot and it's far more green instead of this blue. So I, I you know, Everybody has their own belief, and I'm not. I'm not going to knock any of them. Everybody's going to believe what they got to believe. Here's another photo. This one here shows even more dust in this back area. So it is questionable if this bend had actually been covered for a long time. So it's just odd. Um, let's see. But couldn't uh, couldn't it, couldn't it just simply imply that um, someone rifled through the back of her rev? looking for something well you know that was another question i had doc because it, if someone had handled those bin covers and were afraid that they were they had left fingerprinting or you know biological and they just took them i don't know that correct they, they're nowhere i mean as far as i know they're not in any burn barrel they're not in the burn area nowhere in the quarry they're just gone uh, but also, the what's missing is a tool, and it's probably yes. the, it's probably the tool uh, that uh, was used to knock Teresa on the head with. Now, what's interesting is that they were looking for that identical tool at the salvage yard. Yes, they, they never were. Found yes. No. The, okay. The, so the, he, he's the bizarre thing, right? In nowhere of the questioning of Brendan Dassey does he mention, "Oh, yeah, we whacked her in the head." Yet the investigators are looking for a missing tool in the back of the Toyota RAV4. Now, how do you work that one out? Right? They clearly, clearly they know what happened, right? They got to. I mean, Sturdivant, uh, well, I think it was Sturdivant that was looking for, I know he was looking for a hacksaw blade uh, early on, but I think he yeah, was the one that, I, I can't remember if it was Sturdivant or another agent that was looking for or maybe it was Colburn or Link that was looking for the tire tool. I think it was yeah, one of them. Yeah, they were looking for a tool. Yes. They were looking part for of, a tool. Um, part, of, part of her toolkit that came with her car. Yeah. And the, there's, no, there's no doubt that if you if you clout somebody over the head, uh, there's going to be blood, tissue, and also oh. likely hair, right? So Absolutely. It's going, to be extremely, it's going to be extremely damning. And yet, Nowhere in Brendan's confession do they ever does he ever state, "Oh yeah, we knocked her on the head." That destroys yeah. the entire narrative of the state. It does. Yeah. Well, say now here's another photo of the of the left bend, and it's all shiny. So there's a little bit of dust. I mean, here, but that I can tell up here. I I don't know. I, I just I have a. For me, this bend had was removed and taken. Somebody took it. I don't know if it was the state. I mean, you know, that's another thing. Uh, to my knowledge, none of the officers that were involved, you know, what we've talked about, that noticed the memory card, noticed these bin covers missing that was 
I don't know anyone that stated anything about it. If anyone can remember, please. But, but Jack, but Jack, doesn't that highlight what I've been saying all Absolutely. along? Absolutely, it does. That in, that in situ photos at the very least should have been done or taken at the salvage yard. Absolutely. Therefore, there's no dispute or argument about what was and what wasn't found or taken or disturbed, right? Here we are, right, in 2021. We're, we're talking about missing car parts. That's ridiculous. It is. A simple photograph or a video would have shown, okay, this is how the back looked. This is what was there. This is what was missing. All we're doing is speculating. That's right. That's all we can do because they – they so flaunt. They so flaunt. Would out. you guys want to have a little bit of a discussion, maybe about the VIN plate, the VIN plate in the dash? Uh, we can, sure. I I don't have that photo handy, but um, if you guys want to start it off, I might be able to put it up. Well, uh, there's comments in here that you know saying it looked like that it had been removed and replaced on there. Remiger mentions when he first reads the VIN that it looks like the VIN number, the VIN plate was tampered with, if I remember right, in his report. That's what he says, correct. But what does tampered with actually mean? Right. Does it look like it was unscrewed, and, screwed back on? Yeah. yeah. Well, here's the problem, right? The car has actually multiple VIN numbers all over the place. So if you're going to remove the VIN number from the front, you need to actually remove the VIN numbers, the stickers from all over the vehicle. And not only that, underneath the hood, there are identification numbers, chassis numbers, right? So if you try not disguise uh, the vehicle, wouldn't the first thing you do is take out that big um, sign that says Toyota RAV4 on the back of the vehicle. <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. the, one that's, the one that's screaming, hello, Pam of God, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Well, doesn't that also indicate that someone like Stephen probably wasn't the one that did this because he, of all people, would understand that Vin is all over that car. Uh, yeah, and if it, and if it, and the funny thing, is, a very good point. But the funny thing is this, right? He even told the investigators, "Hey, had I done this, I would have crushed it immediately." Right? There would have been no dilly dallying with of VIN numbers and this and this and this. He would have crushed it immediately, right? Even yeah, told he wouldn't have been sitting around sitting around chit chatting with his mom or anybody else. Or no. taking out or take taking out the crib taking out the cribbits, right? Right, right. Yeah, I'm going through these photos oh, here. The, Go ahead. The, uh, I was going to say, the most ironical thing is this, uh, and Mill Billy pointed this out years ago, like they've done 10,000 photographs all in focus. The photograph of the VIN is out of focus. <laughs> How do you work that one out? The N numbers are out of focus. Whereas the middle numbers, you can read them. So it looks like for some bizarre reason, they decided to um, blur out the total VIN number on the image. Completely bizarre. It it, do, it really doesn't add up um, why they would do that. I may be getting to it here. It's unfortunate there's, you know, 2100 and I mean, I'm glad we've got the photos but man it's kind of a pain in the butt to go through all of them because I don't I don't really have them segregated into folders um, I, I don't really understand why they would do that um, because there's no you know it, it's you know once a car's registered to someone you know you, you can't just uh, somebody just get the vendor and say oh that's my car it doesn't work like that so I'm not sure why they would feel the need to blur uh, the you know part of the VIN number out. You don't you know the the yeah, uh, under the the under the hood photo doc if you remember correct. it's blurred too the yellow correct. sticker. Correct, correct, and I I blew that up, and it's definitely the correct VIN number. So if you were going to um, disguise 
or do a, a swap with another RAV4, my God, you got to change a lot of elements in that vehicle. It's possible, but very, very unlikely. Um, if you're going to do a swap of an entire vehicle, that's a sophisticated thing to do. Uh, and all you need to do is to slip up on one thing and the ruse is up, right? Um, but there's one thing that counteracts the two RAV theory, and that is when they swab the inner door handle of the driver's side, they found touch DNA belonging to Teresa Horbach. Now, if you're going to swap a RAV, how in the hell are you going to get Teresa Horbach's touch DNA on the inner door handle? You can't do that, right? That to me is strong evidence that that RAV is genuine. It was only one RAV. Just my opinion. Let's see here. I've got these, it's going to pop in there here in a second. I'm pulling up the, I've got pulled up the uh, thousands of photos that uh, we've been, yeah, there we go. It's popped in there and I've, I've scrolled down through a lot of them. And it's funny, they've taken more pictures of rivets than they did of the burn pit area where they found it. Let me look at all these. It's just absolutely ridiculous to me. And another thing I, I kind of looked at a little bit. Uh, I was out when I was going through them last night. I was looking at the um, burn barrels, and we're we're going to get to that at some point. I I got to get brave. Maybe maybe get a fifth of Jack Daniels or something to swallow because the the barrels are oh my god. That's a subject that uh, is difficult for everyone. That I don't think anyone has fully ever explained. I I think we we've, we've probably come close, but. Um, Really wish I could find this. There's more barrels. They did take several photographs of the barrels. I, I give them credit for that. And as for the rivets that, that they took for, you say, off of the, the jeans or whatever it is, that could have been clays left by bloody Jody that Stephen was getting ready, you know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, here's another thing they took a lot of pictures of is the this blood tube. I don't know why they took so many, but they took many photos of that. Here we go. I found it. Get that blood up here. This is what you're talking about, Sammy. One small picture or one far away picture of the key from far away. <laughs> All the okay. evidence that they have, they have like little to no pictures on, right? The key, yeah. One whole picture of like I've only seen one picture of the key. They don't even like zoom in or anything. It's like here, let's stand here and take a picture of this key from you know ten ten feet tall, you know, and and then the the bones have no pictures of them being ever anywhere in the pit. How many well, bones do they really have of them pulling bones? Like when they're going through all the barrel stuff, are they like? Here's a bone. Are they taking a picture of one bone every time they pull one out? I don't recall that being no, taken. No, <laughs> yeah, exactly. no. You know, to me, I mean, I, I don't know the full duties of a coroner, but to me, that's something that a coroner would have done, and or or she would have had, she wouldn't have, or he wouldn't have necessarily done that, but they would have had people there that would have detailed, you know, every every movement in some capacity, and probably photographed it, and there would have been a digital record of some type. <laughs> Bethany says the blue uh, lanyard with the key doesn't match the other part with the writing. Um, yeah, I don't know what the, uh, yeah, it's because that's got uh, um, I can't remember where that the, the large uh, part was that goes around your neck. It was a was it a U.S. Air Force maybe uh, lanyard and and uh, thing you go you know that it hooked yeah. to yeah. National National Guard, I think National, it was. National Guard, yeah, that's right. Um, but how do you know it doesn't match? I mean, because it doesn't say National Guard on the little fob part of it, or, or yeah, what? I mean, I, I, I think that I, I think that's probably it's definite. probably a, it, I don't it's, even know. it's probably a separate issue. It's a separate thing that it really doesn't. It may not even matter because they could have been manufactured in two different places. The main thing that matters is that the male and female part will hook together. So Plus I don't she know. Had 
lanyard, like if you listen to the sister's testimony, she gave her that lanyard. And when she gave it to her, she took her keys off the other lanyard that she had had. And there's a picture of her with a purple lanyard around her neck months prior to her supposedly getting the blue one. Yeah, she had a purple lanyard also, and but she, she yep. got one from sister. Yeah, didn't they found they found the 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 big part of the lanyard supposedly inside of the console, right? The in lanyard the was supposed to be in the console, and then the key part, the fob part, was supposed to be in the in the house. In the so we also they they also didn't. No one no 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 officer noticed. Uh, you know. No pictures of it actually being in. No. Unless the lab has pictures we have not seen, which is possible. But there's no pictures of like the lanyard part, the long neck piece that's supposedly in the middle council when they found it. No. Yeah. And doesn't, doesn't that strike you as potentially very nefarious that there's no in situ picture of the uh, lanyard? Because if you're thinking about a planting scenario, how about if that key actually was attached to the lanyard? That's In right. other words, the whole the whole spare key was actually inside the RAV4. All you have to do is disconnect the uh, key from the um, with the fob and leave the lanyard behind. There you go. You've got your key to plant inside Stephen's um, bedroom. That's right. right. There. It's a, you know, like, hey, look, it, what, this was in her car. This was in his room. Ta-da, you know. And it's that that's why, that's why that's such a critical piece of against Stephen because you've got one part of it being in the RAV4 and the other part of the key being inside Stephen Avery's trailer. Now, if you're Stephen Avery, right, why don't you just take the whole thing? Also, why didn't they test the actual black buckle piece for skin cells? Because hell, I, I put those together and pinched my thumb or my finger on the actual clip. Correct. Clip, you know? But but the kicker is this. No blood was found on it, right? And if yeah. Stephen Avery is actively bleeding, he would have had to have unbuckled the fob from the lanyard, right, right. with his fingers. Plus, he would have had to have used his fingers in order to put the key in the ignition. And again, there was no blood noted on the key or on the fob or on the lanyard, which makes the story very, very um, tenuous. It makes no sense at all. Nope. I see Kelly Cowles made a good comment that the light, the light incident with the parking lot happened after she left, uh, after she took the photo of the van. I, I agree with that. I, I completely agree with that. You know, it, 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 to that stupid light, like an idiot. I'm sorry, but that is a big red flag. <laughs> huge, huge. Ryan should have never done that. But you know, again, they're trying to come up with ways to explain various incidences. It's like getting into the RAV itself. Uh, to me, I mean, I, I tend to think that they opened it. They used a Slim Jim at the labor salvage yard. They got inside. They used the a ship lock, uh, ship unlock, move the uh, gear selector into neutral. That's the way they were able to move the raft. That's what I believe. You know, yeah. all the rest, all the rest of it, uh, it because that is that makes the most sense because right. of the dis disassembly dis uh, difficulty of taking the front uh, drive shafts loose. That's a major surgery for a mechanic. So, but 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 that that would explain Jack why they actually went through with the farce of disconnecting the drive shaft because they're going, uh oh, uh, if we actually, uh, if it's proven that we actually opened up the RAV at the salvage yard, right, to in order to move the vehicle. That's right. Uh, that's against protocol. So we better give the impression that we actually, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we undid the drive shaft and here are the bolts. So everything is kosher. Nobody touched a thing. Whereas I think the opposite actually happened. Uh, they would have had to have opened or jemmied the door in order to put the car with the with the bright handbrake also into gear so they can roll the car, right? That's right. So, well, anyway, um, the parking lot. We talked about that some. Um, 
over the past forever. And we talked about it a little bit last week. And um, I think I may have promised that we would talk about it more. And uh, I've got I pulled up, I think there's three photographs that, in, that are in this massive photographs that Henberry got. And this is one of them. I didn't pull up the, uh, I can actually go back to it if we need to, to look at when the date this was taking. But I think it was, uh, well, it was in 06. I, I can't tell you exactly when. I don't remember the date. But there are three of these photographs. And maybe it tells on here when this was logged. Um, now this is 52506. So this is part of probably what they got back from uh, the uh, Wisconsin Crime Lab, you know, State Crime Lab uh, in Madison. So this is a, uh, when they got it back, they got all this stuff back on uh, May 25th. Um, they took photographs of, of uh, these various pieces of uh, evidence. That's what a lot of these are that we've got. So um, I don't remember where the other photographs were. Were they? It's probably in a in a Zellner. Isn't it in a Zellner photo uh, that we've got in one of her briefs or something that? There's a, the difference. I don't remember where the stain is. Is it right here? Is this it? On the left side at the, uh, this amber, amber color. I think that's right. I don't remember. Are you referring to the discoloration on that light? Yes. I thought it was on the, the, far end on the clear plastic side on the on yeah the and that's what i thought yeah that's what i thought as well it's it on the, clear on the far yeah. end of the accident like that's the piece that it broke off of like that orange piece would be that corner like where her car has the damage i thought it was the orange part oh okay i was no, in no, on it, was on the, it was on the clear part i'm sure it was on the clear part that's what I remember seeing too, and I remember Zellner yeah. talking about it in Ma'am too, and pointing yeah, it out. It's on yeah. the it's on the clear part because that if you turn that light ring the other way, the the orange bit is to the right. Um, that's where you can see it in the picture where we were looking at the memory card. You could see the orange tint. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to pull up the MAM2 and see if I can grab some screenshots from it. Um, yeah, it was just a bit, just a bit meant to the right, I think. Disc from the back seat. Maybe that's where we've seen it. I, I just felt like, I feel like I remember Zellner uh, commenting in MAM2 that, you know, perhaps that um, red or orange tint or scuff, whatever it was on the clear part, had happened, um, you know, if they were uh trying to use the rav to push uh, that red vehicle out of its way or something um and i i i could be wrong but i think that's what why what was said in ma'am too yeah that's right i remember that as well Rhonda. yes there was a, a there was a a rust colored pinto uh at yeah. the end of um uh one of the trails the one that contains the conveyor belt and uh, normally the Avery's had shut that off to prevent people from going uh, to yes. and fro, yes. but they discovered that it was open, <laughs> which right. meant that a vehicle could go through. Somebody and moved sort it. Of like, yeah, somebody moved it. And that and now makes perfect sense if the Toyota RAV4 actually used uh, the front bumper to, to move it out the way. And Earl Avery said it was just a shell there was no motor, so it was very light and right. it could easily move. So if you're moving a RAV4 in darkness, you could have easily had a collision. Yeah. What's interesting is that, that those cars were blocking the, the area to the north of the conveyor belt, but the south, the area to the south of the conveyor belt was wide open, so somebody could have driven in there without any blockades. So if that was the case, then this person who was driving it probably didn't know that. Yeah, like uh, like Ryan Hilligus. Well, <laughs> well I, I certainly think I certainly think it was moved in there the on the late on the 
Kelly is asking if you can please put up the pic of the property. She sent you. Pick so of the what? Kelly's asking you to put up the pic that she sent you showing the natural pic of the RAV uh, versus the court RAV they used uh, to make blood look more red in court for jurors. Let's see if I can. Sorry, Jinx. <laughs> That's okay. You guys can. Go ahead, Jinxie. Oh, yeah, I might be able to do this, maybe. I just think it's strange that that tinge is there on some of the photos, but then it's no there. To me, that's that's been wiped off. That was a mistake they made, and it wasn't until they were looking back over the forties they noticed it, and then they've cleaned it. I think some of the earlier crime lab photos were not digital; they were developed, and therefore they'd had to be scanned in, and the scanner could have had some, you know, settings on it that could have altered the color as well. All right, right. You know, speaking of that, if you look at some of the pictures that were used in court, it looks like there was like red uh, ink or something that spilled somewhere at one point. And you can see like little specks of red, red ink all over these pictures if you really look at them. So, kind of interesting. Let's see if that worked. Technology, I don't know if it's always your friend, but we'll try. <laughs> Well, OBS is a little weird uh, because uh, things tend to be need to be preloaded, but um, yeah, there we go. I think this is the one she, that Kelly's talking about. Hopefully it is. Uh, this shows a uh, original picture, natural lighting, and then the um, court picture where uh, I'm sure Kratz had, uh, you know, whoever. To do Maybe a that's right that they spilled all over the pictures. Well, I mean, you you can clearly tell. I mean, she I zoomed in there. Yeah. You, you can clearly thanks. tell that, that the contrast and, and different things have been screwed with uh, pretty heavily, actually. You know, and, you know, you can look at photos from, yeah. um, you can look at photos from the uh, .org site and then from the guilters.com site, and there definitely are differences between the two. Uh, I don't know. Um, I know that Skip Top said very clearly that he did not screw with the photographs at all, and I believe him. He, he I never caught Skip in any kind of uh, doing anything nefarious to the photos to enhance one thing or another. He just loaded what he had, what uh, what he pointed. Were the ones they actually used at trial, if memory serves? Yeah, so. the bottom, the bottom one. Yes, that's that's correct. Evidence. So whoever put this into evidence was most likely the one who changed the the lighting and contrast of it. Yes. Most likely rats, so that you can see that blood more. Absolutely. You know, he definitely those, in the trial. In the those, trial. Yeah, those, those photos. You're correct. They were in Sheree Colhane's um, PowerPoint that presentation. Point. That's right. The one with the the one with the extreme contrast, as Kelly pointed out. And it really does make the blood look uh, much more vivid and red. So was it Sherry Colhane then who altered those pictures for her? Well, I'm not sure whether she's a photography expert, but I would dare say that they would have manipulated the original photos and mucked around with the contrast. Graffy was. Some of her. Sorry. Graffy. He was a he was Graffy. the photo guy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So all, all, all Colhane had to do was to say, look, can you please enhance this because I'm going to use it in my presentation because her photographs in her PowerPoint presentation are crystal clear. They are amazing, the clarity of those pictures. They are. They're very good, very good photos. Uh, I, I didn't think to, to use that. I mean, a lot of the photos, I mean, actually all the photos that we when we have them, but I mean, they're so, um, they're, they're really good pictures in comparison to the ones that we got, the few that we had originally and compare them to her PowerPoint. Wow. It was eye opening. So, um, you know, 
for Jack, Kratz. I was going. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Jack. I was going to say this so good that you can actually see the smear of the blood on the black CD case. That's how oh. good those. That's that's how good those photos are. Yet yes. if you see other pictures, they're of a lower resolution. That's so right. So I think she used the very best ones and manipulated the contrast to prove a point. Because remember Ken Kratz in his opening statements that there were pools of blood everywhere. <laughs> that didn't turn out to be the case. No. Well, you know, looking at this bottom photo, how red that blood stands out. Uh, it's like, you know, the, if, a, if I'm a juror and I see that, I've been thinking, oh, my God, this poor girl was beat to death, you know, and she's shot and everything else, you know. So it's manipulated. Yeah, he, they def I they do, definitely manipulated. I do want to make a comment here on this with the seats. I believe one photo, the seats are scooted forward more than the other photo, which is why you see more or different trim where it looks different. I believe it's still the same. Um, but the one picture has it scooted forward more. And I think if I'm not mistaken in her model, that RAV, you can actually take those back seats out completely if you wanted to. Just saying. I think you can, but you, yeah, I think you have to unbolt some various things, but yeah, I think they are definitely removable. Uh, but uh, yeah, to sir. Gene's point, Gene, go ahead, oh dog, and I'll say what I'm going to say. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, certainly you can see that from the top one, it's close to the floor and the bottom one, it's lifted up a little bit as if it's kind Thank of you. tilting. Thank you. See that one? And then that, you can definitely tell that there's those seats when you, when they're folded down, they drop lower. So that's probably a function of whatever mechanisms in there that, that creates that uh, for uh, possibly for headroom. You know, if you're stacking something in the back, to give you a few more inches of headroom um, or whatever. Definitely raised up. Yeah. Big time. Oh my. That's a huge difference. Good point that's there. Uh, your body room. <laughs> well, you know, that's okay. You know, there's another report. Um, I think I said a report. It's Stalky's mentioned us talking about blood. Uh, there was actually blood uh, on something underneath. I think it was the left one under on a bar, but they didn't test it for DNA. I think they may have isolated it. I can't remember, but there is a cross piece. And I actually asked, um, I can't remember. I think it may have been Buting. I asked him about that. And he didn't, uh, best I recall, he didn't have any information other than what we have. It's interesting, though, if there's blood underneath on a bar underneath one of these seats, or maybe it was, no, I think he said it was a blood stain. Um, does anyone else remember the, the Stalky's bench notes? I, I, know, I know others have looked at it besides me that um, I'm guessing that Doc has probably looked at them more than I have, but... Um, there was a blood stain on a bar or something, and it didn't get tested, as far as I know. And I think that Zellner actually mentioned it in one of her briefs about that. And, uh, that's where I picked it up, and I went looking for it. And I talked to um, someone on Reddit. I think it was in Monroe. We, we talked about it uh, actually at length. I believe he. Uh, not all the not all the blood not all the blood stains were tested. You're correct. But no, like seven or um, like seven or eight that they didn't test. I mean, they didn't get a profile. Were, yes, there, there was only a sub sub sampling of the blood drops. That is correct. Uh, I suppose when you think about it, they stopped testing the moment they found female blood and male blood, and that male blood belonged to Stephen. They essentially stopped testing the Rav uh, because they actually got what they wanted. So it goes back to if you don't want the question answered, don't ask the question. Well, here's the problem, right? The further t correct, the further testing you do, the more complex the picture becomes. So keep it simple. Absolutely. Well, this is a really good photo. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for sending that and reminding me. I'm glad we could get it up here for everyone. Um, you know, uh, this we moved away from the parking lot. We can go back to it here in a minute. But um, 
I think it goes to a, you know a larger thing of what Kratz was doing throughout because this this is not the only photograph. There there's another one. I'm I'm almost positive. Actually, I'm sure there is. It's got this more enhanced uh, lighting contrast for you know they had the uh, Groffy or whoever at the Wisconsin Crime Lab do this enhancement, uh, but in effect. You know, I, I, I hate to say it, but uh, it, it's true that the defense didn't argue it from this other side of what Kelly's got presented here as the natural lighting, original, you know, kind of an original photo with no enhancement. And it's not as blue. The, the stains didn't stand out. But again, it's altering of what people perceive. perceive. Uh, and a juror sees that blood and it's all red. He's like, Jesus. Now, considering... When this photo, the bottom photo was taken, um, I don't know exactly when it was taken, um, but it was around, wasn't it around the 7th or the 8th? Didn't, didn't that sound right? When Stocky, or uh, not Stocky, but Groffy, I said he took these photographs. I think it was the 7th and the 8th. Do you, do you remember? That sounds right. That sounds right. Correct. So, I mean, to me, if, I, of course, I don't. I'm one of the ones that doesn't really feel like that Teresa was necessarily killed on the 31st. I think that it was some few days after the fact. I don't know that. I can't prove it, but that's just my belief. I, I just don't think that she was. Uh, uh, everything was done in a neat, tidy uh, bow, as Kratz indicated at trial. I think that it was uh, possibly as late as the second or the third, um, but definitely within. You know, the next few days. So, um, this blood that's in the back, you know, looking at how blood dries over a period of time, and I've cut myself, I think everyone here has, they've dropped it on carpet or whatever, and it tends to turn this, this darker, rusty, and even depending on the, you know, the surface that it lands on, it may, it might even turn out to be a, a dark brown or even blackish looking. Um, I know I've cut myself and, you know, bite my hand on my, or whatever, on my jeans, and it turns into this rusty red, dark color. So it being this bright red in this bottom photograph, it's, I don't know. By the, him enhancing that and it, or, or uh, presenting this at, at court, like it's like fresh blood, and which is what it looks like. It looks like it's, you know, you relatively just cut yourself, but it's pretty bright. And it's not as bright, bright as bright, bright blood, but it's still, to me, it's nowhere near what blood would dry like. And for them not to question that, jump on it. Yalataki says, uh, now I have to wonder, was the jury made aware that the photos were enhanced? And I probably, I doubt it. <laughs> I don't think so. I, I don't remember anything in the trial about them mentioning about enhancing these photos. Uh, as, far, as I recall, when, Callahan was making her presentation. She just went through it and the photos were there and no one argued the fact that there was any kind of enhancement. Um, these photos. No, no, no enhancement was made, was mentioned, but here's the question. And I think Kelly may address this later on. Um, that blood would have to be what five or six days old in the back of that RAV, depending well, I, on when Teresa Horbach was placed in the back of the RAV. If she was if she was attacked um, on the thirty first and placed in the back of the rav on the thirty first, that blood's got to be what six or seven days old. The Minimum. question is, uh, would blood that's out of your body appear that color after seven days? I don't think so. I mean, I'm no expert, but. I've cut myself enough in my life to to know that you know once blood hits it dries it just it changes colors it it's different uh, it uh, you know it goes dark it goes maroon so yes Kelly so, says uh, you're Kelly says you're right Jack it looks almost fresh but when you look at the original the blood was what you said rusty brown makes it look aged a few days. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I have that photo in here or not. The photo used at trial of the uh, ignition stain looks really red with the color scheme they picked here. Well, yeah, that's one of the original photos that I 
pulled up because we were talking about, you know, originally uh, this photo here. Let me get to it here and blow it up. I mean, it, it looks pretty red to me, uh, you know, on that gray, grayish looking uh, plastic or whatever it is. That's pretty red to me. So, you know, the, the question becomes, um, obviously, I feel certain I can't prove it. But my, my theory is, is that as soon as they got inside of it at the crime lab, whatever was done and found, I'm not even going to go as far as to say that Avery's blood was even there because personally, I don't believe it was. But whatever, it's to me, it's bright. It's a brighter red. It's not this maroonish um, type color that I think blood dries as, which if you look up here in this, a little bit above that, there's a little bit of a swap, swap there that, Looks uh, more maroonish, but it's very light. This is pretty red. Yeah, it does appear like all the photos from that batch, from the first crime lab photos, that um, they were shot and developed and scanned in. Um, but they all kind of have a weird off-color look, especially like even the exterior ones, like the RAV looks really deep blue. So it could have been they picked a couple to see which settings would show the blood the most and kept those settings and scanned them all in. Well, this photo that's fixed to come up is another photo of the same thing. But as you can see, it's much bluer. I've got that bluish tinge to it. So another one that you know, has probably had some kind of filter or some kind of enhancement done to it. Well, you know something? I had a neighbor that called me once. They had an emergency. They had cut their leg wide open. And there was just blood everywhere when I got there in their garage. And you know right away that blood started to coagulate and change color. Sure. I mean, sure. you know, right away within moments. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, blood, you know, the clotting, the clotting factor and the coagulation and all that. You know, that happens. Uh, uh, well, again, I don't know. I'm, I'm not in that field, so. Uh, but, you know, within a short amount of time, you, know, you get the, the coagulation factor, which, you know, is part of the e, all the EDTA purpose is to keep blood liquid. So as far as the other, I, I just, I don't know. Um, I can't remember if I had, had a photo of the back, if I included it. I think I've got it. Uh, there's one. It's not really... I'm looking for that evidence photo. I think I kept it in this batch. Yeah, here it is. This is the uh, one of the few high def photos that we actually got from way back, uh, and it is uh, actually pretty clear. You can see how good it comes in there. But this is the one of the ones. This is the evidence photo that was presented, and uh, again, this is one of the ones that Skip got when we did the FOIAs way back, and uh, he just scanned it in as is. Now, I'm almost positive. Uh, I'm going to take that back because I don't remember how much uh, he actually got that was digital and how much he actually got that was uh, you know, uh, physical paper that had to be scanned in and then uploaded to uh, the, the .org site. But I think this may have been a digital photo that he got. But we can see, based on the photograph that Kelly presented, of the natural lighting to how blue this entire area is. I mean, that the fabrics is, is a more blue, all of it. It's got more of that blue tinge. I wish we had one a comparison of this same photo without this blue filter. It would be really interesting to see. And then there's your ra big raised up part inks about with the, the back end with the uh, parking lot under it. So can, can I just comment? Sure. Um, normally, normally what they do uh, when crime scene photographs are taken, uh, they do one which is slightly underexposed, normal exposure, and overexposed. So you get the full spectrum of, of photographs on the on the one scene. I don't see that here. I I see selective uh, use of selective photographs. So th what we need to see is if these are digital then okay you need to you need to go back and have a look at the original digital but normally they take photographs on a normal camera with film right and therefore you can process uh the film so 
I've seen crime scenes where, like I said, they take three photos, slightly underexposed, slightly overexposed, and normal exposure. I don't see that here. No. And they use that as a comparison basis, right? Correct. Yes, correct. Because depending on the exposure, you get different levels of detail in the pictures. Agreed. You know, I think I actually took this photo. I'm almost sure I did. This was a, probably two years ago. And I have another program. Uh, it's a freebie. It's been around forever. It's called Viewprint. But there are other uh, programs you can use, too. I took this photograph and I did a negative image. It's interesting to see, I mean, not only this one, but anywhere where there's blood, how bright these photographs that were provided by the Wisconsin Crime Lab, how that blood, it's just, it's like a beacon that um, I did. I don't have those handy. I'm not even sure I even kept them, but I couldn't really, it was just for my edification. Uh, and curious in how that would turn out in a, in a negative, uh, a negative uh, photograph. It's uh, really interesting, though. So, but uh, anyway, um, I think we've talked about all that, Harrington. Um, I didn't really go through too too many more of the. Um, is there any more questions about the photographs that's in the? We're looking at. I haven't even looked at the chat in a while. Any any more questions? Anyone wants to talk about about the? Photographs. If not, I'm going to close those off, and um, we can talk about any of the DCI reports that you know anybody wants to talk about. Because I, I mean, I looked at a few more uh, in, in in relation, but I didn't really find anything per se um, about what we're talking about in relation to how Odog has connected these four or five reports together and what they did. You know, and it, it, a lot of it does come to speculation because we don't have all the answers. There's a vacuum of information. There, there, you know, DCI reports that uh, were denied uh, in this same capacity of how um, Rookie and Yoras got these, uh, you know, two hundred, almost three hundred um, DCI reports that we did get. There are some that, and these these were gone through KSO, um, FOIA'd. And but there were several that they denied with without reason. One of them was uh, DCI report 304 that's referenced in another report, and it's talking about. Uh, and this is for another open mic. We can't really get into it too much here, but th- uh, DCI report 304 is detailing Bassbender's uh, 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 whatever he did with uh, the Valley CD keeping it uh, i mean i i can't really say anything more because we don't have the report but that report was denied and i you know i don't know why you know it's kind of like asking why certain jail calls were denied um between uh, jody and, and steve um, we we can't get them without real explanation other than they're saying they're sealed and evident with evidence to Graham wants you to zoom in on the picture on the right please okay of the uh, card there. Oh, the memory card, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's my, ad- I added the text where I see the name, so. Yeah, O-Dog did the enhancement here. Uh, this is a photograph that he sent to me. Yeah. Enhancement and addition of text. <laughs> Just to yeah, kind of outline yeah. where I see the name. Yeah. And I can kind of pull that kind of right there. And everybody can kind of see. Again, I think that, you know, they, these names, her name was on that card to keep it to make sure that, you know, if auto, when Auto Trader got it, they knew it was from her. I think that's a smart thing to do. Maybe they told her to do it, just uh, maybe not in any you know, written instruction. It's just in part of her training. You know, you're going to be sending these memory, these SD cards back, put your name on it so we know it's yours, and you know, we'll take it from there. Um, does Graham have any comment? Let me look here. I hear him talking about blood. David Kobe's talking about, I cleaned up blood after a dog bite. The next day, uh, it was a dark brown, almost black. That's what I'm saying. Uh, You know, it it depends. It varies by individual to some degree, I've noticed. But almost in every case, once blood dries, uh, a stain, you know, if it's on carpet or on your pants or clothing, whatever, it dries really dark, this 
And I, I understand that, you know, fabric and whatever that's behind it can alter that color. But nonetheless, it still draws a much darker color. It's not, it's maroon. It's not that bright red appearance that we see in these photographs. So I think that, I think that tells its own story. Um, any, are there any, any other questions that we've missed about? Cause I really haven't been paying too much attention to chat. Well, I've been watching and there's been a lot of conversation about the blood and, uh, you know, different things about, they just needed to frame him like quickly. So, oh, that, oh yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the blinders went on. There's no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, um, if there's no other questions or comments, there's a, uh, we can open it up to anyone here that uh, may have anything they want to discuss before we uh, do a wrap. Uh, I'm thankful to the, uh, internet, uh, God's in the great maker that everything is ran relatively smooth today. I haven't, haven't noticed any kind of real lag or anything like that. So I'm, I'm thankful for that. I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, that was really for me. I mean, we had a lot of people on, we were talking and it's pretty embarrassing, you know, for a host, you know, when they're streaming that all of a sudden their, their junk's not working. It's like, oh, Whoa, what's going on here? So, um, Talking about just don't mention, just don't mention Ken Kratz. Oh my God! <laughs> Otherwise, it's the curse of Kratz. Well, you know, I, I will talk about that guy for just a second uh, because it, it continues to come up in conversation. Not only on Discord, I've gotten into some conversation on Reddit about it. Uh, this uh, video that he released—that's um, th a damn. Now I don't know where that will go eventually. You know, when things do move in one direction or another, but I think at some point that is going to have to uh, be front and center because videoing a, a lawyer and his client is a, it's a constitutional violation. You don't do it. I don't care how bad you want someone, the cops want someone, you don't do that. And then, and if you do do it, you don't make it available to anyone ever so I, I think that at some point that that's going to blow up into a uh, pretty big deal because now you know if you say oh well that's not really such a big deal you know in all this world of, of craziness but it is a big deal you know we have to realize the normalcy of what's normal we have to bring it back to what is what the law is even if you know people that um, you know we had a few guilters that came on during uh, Dr. Suckman's presentation yesterday, um, they believe Stephen is guilty and they don't really care too much about, you know, any kind of these old pesky constitutional violations because they think he did it. And I get that. And there are people out there that I think that did a crime that other people might not necessarily think they did. And from my perspective, Hey, you're guilty. See ya. I'm done with you, but I don't hang around their case either. I'm done with them. I don't, I don't continue to hang on to try to prove someone's guilt, but I still get that other side of it. However, in the real world, a lawyer and his client, I don't care if you like him or not, have the right to a private conversation. You don't record them. So how many more conversations were recorded in that, in these privacy rooms at, K at the Queso jail? I'm not supposed to be any cameras in there. And I dare say that there was a microphone hooked to it as well. Who else that, you know, that they, they, Maybe you may or may not have been at. I'm willing to bet that goes on quite often. I'm sure of it. I mean, for that one to exist, that can't be the only one. Tells the story, doesn't it? It does to me. I mean, uh, I, well, yes. well, well, dare I say his Sorry, name? Yes, Ken Avery. <laughs> Ken Kratz listened to all the phone calls. Sure he did. When uh, Stephen was in jail. And he, he specifically wrote that. I would say that he tried to get as much leverage against Stephen as he possibly could. Could that mean using incognito means? I would say absolutely. The more information he could get on Stephen, he would do it. It's just, um, 
the, this uh, absence of information that we don't know as to why he would uh, release that video. Um, it, it almost, you, you have to look at, I mean, for me, I have to look at what was going on in his life that we certainly don't know about. But was there something someone had said to him from the state or whatever that he felt threatened enough to let that video out publicly? Uh, because I, and clearly he's had the video. What, and what else does he have that he hasn't released? Was it, I mean, BB has said before she felt like it was a, he was firing a warning shot. Uh, to those around him and said, you know, you need to, you need to watch it because I've got this and um, I'm not, you know, I'm not afraid to not let it go. You're not going to throw me under the bus. I don't know if that's what he meant, what he's doing or not, but um, I don't know. I, I think, I think that, that that could blow up and that alone to me should warrant a new trial for Avery because you you know, when you when you preach about you know, even if people that think he's guilty, you you can't just say, well, that's okay for them to record them. It's not okay. You don't do that because they could have been talking about any number of things. So you don't record that. So anyway, I've I've beat on that horse long enough. Uh, well, any other? Well, I mean, well, I was just going to say it could well be a, a a card up his sleeve, basically say, hey boys, if you throw me under the bus, look what I've got here. Because don't forget, it was Fallon, remember? Fallon, who said in the trial, you do so at your own risk. That That's is right. when the defense were trying to blame the police of planting evidence. So, you know, they were, they were doing subtle threats across the, um, you know, in the courtroom. And, you know, by Ken Kratz releasing that footage, oh boy, he just breached. How many, how many laws did he just breach? Uh, well, it's well you know something, yeah. what, what does that tell you? That they were keeping track of their every move. Every move. Every move. Yeah. Correct. Correct. And you just wonder at the salvage yard whether their uh, phone trafficking was being recorded and monitored. Yeah. Uh, it, it speaks to a, a really large issue of... Um, I talked to someone about um, where this footage would have went to because the jailer, John Burns, uh, which we read in the pretrial, he said that there was no cameras allowed or microphones, whatever, inside those privacy rooms. So somebody said, well, maybe he didn't know. Maybe he didn't. I, I don't know, but I find that a little hard to believe because what would that that feed have been sent to would they have sent it off site well that creates another problem <laughs> so who's at this off site place that's collecting this video um but I, I don't i don't believe that i think it was all done internally um i don't know how he couldn't have known i guess it's possible but well i mean this is obviously a topic for another open mic. Absolutely. But what what would happen if, if Stephen Avery confessed? Yeah, yeah, I did kill Teresa Hobart. Could they actually use that information or would it be suppressed because they've well, got to buy illegal means? Well, that, that's, that's just it right there. Anything that he says in that, they couldn't have really openly used. Um, they would have to have did a workaround and that's, well, you know, that brings up, you know, this is, again, you're right. This is from a later conversation. Um, the lawsuit or the motion that Avery brought in 2013 that said he was being surveilled. Um, how he got that tidbit, I can't really remember, but, you know, uh, we can go through the uh, some of the information that we do have that uh, the investigator went through that Judge Angie, you know, signed up the investigators and, Basically, the investigator was stonewalled by Queso, completely stonewalled. So Judge Andy basically said, oh, well, you know, nothing happened. Bye. Denied. You weren't surveilled. But in fact, he was. So I, it would be really curious to find out uh, the uh, exact thing that prompted Stephen to even suggest it. Because, I mean, if you read through, I mean, of course, he, he was no lawyer. If you read through uh, his motion, though, it, he, he actually did surprisingly well. Anyway, if there 
If there are no other questions, I guess this is as good a time to uh, end this particular one uh, on the DCI report part two. I'm not saying that next week there won't be a part three. There may be. If I find something interesting or somebody does that I think. Jack, could, yep. Can I, can I make a final comment of sure. what you were saying about the surveillance? I know this is a topic for another discussion, but it's interesting that when the detectives or when the law enforcement officers went inside his trailer, they were bitterly complaining, oh, he's got police scanners, you know, the dirty rascal. <laughs> and yet, what were they doing to Stephen? They were recording him. Well, yeah, and, and it's a record. It's a record in towing service, too. Most all of them Correct. towing services Correct. use scanners. Yes, they do. That's how, that's how the news reporters know which, which crime scenes to go to or a fire or an accident really quick because they're listening to the police chatter. And when you think about it, they operate a salvage yard. They've got a, a tow truck. If they hear an accident has taken place, they want to go on the scene, right? Collect, right. The, collect the vehicles, get some money. Yeah, I'm not sure in that time frame, but I, I still think in, in 2005 time frame, they still had contracts with the county. I think they did. Somebody else could probably uh, answer yeah. that better than I can. But so they would, you know, if they did, I'm sure that there were phone calls that were made, you know, when they, when, when a tow was needed, if somebody hadn't responded. Correct. But still, at the Correct. same time, there are probably other times that a phone call might not have happened. Correct. Correct. And that's how that's how they discovered that his number plates got set over the airwaves because they listened to it on the scanner. Right. That's right. Yeah. It is interesting. Oh, well, conversation for another open mic, I think, Jack. Yeah. And uh, we've uh, we've mentioned the burn barrels. There are there. Are, you know, there are so many uh different areas that um, I think we can all agree that deserve a, a more of a discussion. Uh, you know, you know, a lot of people that have been around, around a long time, you know, this is an appreciation to everyone. And, you know, people say, well, you're just talking about the same thing over and over. But, you know, we have to understand that not everyone has been exposed to everything that maybe I have or, you know, Doc has or whoever. You learn things all the time. And we're educating the noobs. <laughs> Thank you. Educating the new people that have come along. A lot of people are saying, oh, I didn't know that. And, you know, we've known it for a long time. We just accept it. So it is interesting. Um, uh, you know, wanting, wanting to keep this conversation going. Uh, we are, you know, clearly uh, we're waiting for uh, the... Um, a court of appeals to make a decision. Hopefully that's going to come within the next month or two. I said, I projected spring of this year. I hopefully I'm, I'm right, but uh, we'll see. Looks like wizard. The gov has joined us. Gov. Gov here. I see him. There Hi, he is. Guys. Sorry. I, sorry. I was a bit late. That's okay. Appreciate you coming. I see Neverly has snuck in here. Susan oh. has snuck in here. A lot of sneakers. Great. Good. So anyway, any subjects that any questions before I go? I don't I think we're looking good. good. Okay. Well, let's okay. be thinking about what the, you know, if there's things out there that people want to want to talk about. It doesn't have to be my subject. There's so many. Pick one. Now, if you say burn barrels, uh, you know, I'm probably going to hit you, but I'm kidding. It don't even have to be about the case, does it? You can move into what other it, areas. You like, can move into yeah. if you want to. If you want to talk about another case, we actually talked about a few weeks ago. Which one was it, Jinx? The Darley Routier case that a lot of people are interested in. A lot of people think she's guilty. A lot of people think she's not. It's a very interesting case, though. Um, yeah, I've kind of read a little bit into that case too. You know the Chris Tap case that was a. Oh my God! What a god awful case! Oh, I, I could talk about that guy. Um, I was so dumbfounded at what he did. Anyway, I'm getting way off track here. Uh, I want to thank Who's, everyone. Go ahead. Who is that you're talking about, Jack? Chris, Chris Tapp. Tapp. Yeah, murdered his wife and his two daughters. Stuffed them in the, the damn old, old drums uh, off his work site. Awesome. His name Watts. Chris Watts. Watts. Chris Watts. I said tap. Chris okay. Watts. My bad. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Chris Watts. Yeah. yeah. 
that damn guy. Horrifying. Yeah. I mean, he's a monster in my opinion. Just, and you know, to, for him to do it just because he didn't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he was thinking about alimony and, you know, all that child support and all that. And he just wanted to be with this other girl he fell in love with. Uh, wow. Anyway, um, anyone that has any suggestions, please forward them to me on discord or, or even on Reddit, you know, whatever the things that they might want to discuss, we can incorporate you know, a couple of subjects into one open mic. We're, these are kind of an extended kind of thing. I appreciate everyone's patience from last week. Uh, and apologize yet again for my internet, uh, biting the dust, but, uh, Hey, that's the way it goes. Um, so if there's nothing else, this has been a foul play production. And we're out.